Welcome to another episode of Submission Radio. It's the 8th of Feb. Dennis Grouder here with Kasper Ozalowski. Kas, what a big week in MMA. I mean, so much to talk about this week. Yeah, absolutely heaps. It's been a roller coaster ride. The aftermath of UFC 183 still lingers in the air. Anderson Silva and Nick Diaz dual failed drug tests. There's a lot to talk about, and that's what we're going to be covering this week. We're going to be talking about each failed drug test, what it does to their legacies, what happens now, where we go from here. But of course, we've got guests on the show. We've got none other than the legend himself, Frank Shamrock. He's going to be on the show. A quick update with him. We actually caught up with him a little bit earlier, caught up with him yesterday. He was a very, very busy man and uh, he had a conference to go to. So we squeezed in a really quick Frank Shamrock interview. Uh, We got Richard Perez. For those who don't know, that is Nick Diaz's boxing trainer. I can't wait to speak to him. Obviously, a lot to talk about regarding Nick Diaz. And then, of course, one of the hottest guys coming out of UFC 183, as mentioned by Bleacher Report, Talis Lates. He's so going to be right on, so hot right now. So hot right now. He's going to be on the show chatting to us about his big win over Tim Bosch and uh, what's next for the Brazilian's career. And of course, we want to know everyone's thoughts on this whole Anderson Silva situation. So it's going to be an Anderson Silva, Nick Diaz extraordinaire of a show. And I can't wait. Yeah, that's right. I almost feel like one of those fashion magazines. And, you know, tell us later, he's so hot right now coming out of UFC 183. Next thing you, you and me are going to start doing is we're going to start breaking down people's outfits yeah. outside the arena as they're who, going who wore it better? Yeah, who, who wore like, it better? Who, who, that, ty- that Tyron Woodley, those shoes, they're so 2014. <laughs> they don't match the colors of his top. Now, he, he's always color coordinated. That was a bad example. But, guys, if you do want to t- talk about color coordination <laughs> or fashion and MMA or actually anything that just the stuff that really matters, like what's <laughs> happening during the week or what you think of the show, anything like that, at Submission AUS. We're on Twitter. We love chatting to you guys. Leave a question or uh, comment below. We love uh, doing all that if you're listening on YouTube. We're available on a million different uh, podcast websites where we're on iTunes, Stitcher, we're on TuneIn Radio, we're on SoundCloud if that's your thing. And, you know, we're always taking suggestions about the ones that you guys enjoy listening you know your shows on so always feel free to shoot us a comment and tell us what you want to listen to submission radio on and we'll work to get that happening but Cass, you know we've got a lot of guests uh, on the show don't we today yeah we do we're going to be starting with frank shamrock then we're going to be talking to richard perez nick diaz's boxing coach and then we're going to be finishing the show with talis Lates, and then our discussion about anderson silva nick diaz and all of those things uh probably give you a heads up if you are listening on youtube uh give us a comment let us know what you think. That is what the discussion is about. We always respond to comments. If you say something funny or whatever, or just have an opinion, we love chatting with people. Let us know what you think. And uh, just giving you a heads up, those are the topics that we'll be discussing. But in couple, theory... A cu- couple of comment whores we are. Love yeah. the comment. Love looking at the comment, reading the comment, if we thinking could, about the comment, talking if, about the comment, tell our friends about the comments. Just if, comments. If we could print out the comments and roll around in, in like a big bed, <laughs> not together, separately, separate beds or bunk beds, that would also be fine. Then uh, we would absolutely do that. So the more comments, the better. We love hearing what people think. And uh, if you are listening on iTunes or Stitch or anything like that, hey, give us a rate. We notice uh, there's a lot of love on YouTube. There's not many ratings on uh, the podcast uh, platforms. So feel free to do that. But I think without further ado, it's time to get right into it. And here's our first guest. Our next guest is a former UFC light heavyweight champion, a WEC light heavyweight champion, and a strike force middleweight champion. You may know him from his battles around the world or his hit show, Jim Rescue, which was an awesome show last year. Frank Shamrock, welcome to Submission Radio. Oh, right on. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you back on the show, Frank. We always enjoy chatting to you. Now, uh, you know, we were excited to see that you're starting to do a number of seminars in the US. What motivated you to go back into teaching? Well, it's pretty much my little girl. She, um, I got her all excited about martial arts, and she's on a whole martial arts journey. So she told me that I should be teaching martial arts. So thus, I'm teaching martial arts now. <laughs> Simple. All right. Well, uh, I guess what's the most exciting part about this big journey? You know, what are some of the places that you're going to be going around, you know, in America, uh, teaching all these uh, Frank Shamrock seminars? Well, right now we're going to do the uh, East Coast and the West Coast, and then we'll probably do the uh, middle of the U.S., and then we'll probably shoot over and do, like, uh, some European um, European countries. Wow. And, um, yeah, my friends want me to go to uh, South America, although I just haven't really committed to that because school is still in session. Um, so, but, yeah, I figured, uh, you know, like, uh, when I was younger, I would uh, just travel the world and I'd teach and I'd kind of spread the you know, spread the message and, you know, share the new techniques I was learning as the sport of mixed martial arts was evolving. And um, I really felt like I was at the forefront of that whole 
evolution and um so it's nice to go back through and just see where everybody's at and uh you know use and teach uh for you know really good techniques that have kind of stand, stood the test of time and that have proven really valuable for both traditional martial arts and then mixed martial arts training uh frank i want to ask you because i know a lot of the european fans must be curious you said you're going to europe whereabouts in europe uh, are you going to go do you know yet no it hasn't been decided yet um I've been, uh, I've had quite a few requests to go to uh, Ireland, but I might just start there. Plus, I'm really into hiking these days. Mm. So, um, I really want to do some hiking and kind of combine the two, uh, the two activities. But I just haven't decided on a place yet. This, the, um, the one in Long Island, the East Coast one, just came up as part of other productions that I was doing. I'm giving a keynote for um, the uh, Martial Arts Business Association. Um, and then I thought I should teach because my daughter keeps saying that I should teach and I figure a six year old pretty much knows what's going on with the world. So you should, you know, follow their lead, follow their lead when, uh, you know, when given the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, uh, the six, you got to keep the six year olds happy. Now I mentioned Jim Resky, you know, me and Casper and a lot of the other Australians, we really got really into the show. There's some really great episodes. Then we were pretty disappointed when we had Randy Couture on our show a few weeks ago and he mentioned there wouldn't be any more episodes. Is that true? Because the show was awesome. Yeah. Unfortunately right now they haven't ordered more, which is uh, sort of a new vibe in the uh, television industry. Um, you know, the show did really well. It was really well received in, uh, on television and w with ratings and in, in the industry themselves. Uh, but yeah, it just, it wasn't picked up. So I guess we're, uh, I guess it's done. I don't know. Maybe, well, you say they haven't ordered any more yet. Maybe you and Randy need to do some kind of new show where it's like Network Rescue, and then you do Spike first, <laughs> and you're like, here's your problem, not enough Gym Rescue, then they have to follow your advice, and then boom, more Gym Rescue. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you, you scare them into it, Frank. I've seen I've seen an angry Frank Shamrock on the show, and I would not say no to you if you get angry, so I think that's all that needs to happen. Well, for sure, yeah, and I got angry a couple times on that show because, uh, you know, I didn't really realize that, that uh, the gym industry and the fitness industry was very similar to the martial arts industry and that there was a lot of people that lacked business acumen and that, you know, just didn't really have a plan for their business. Mm. Um, so it was easy to get, it was easy to get riled up when you're facing a guy who's, you know, losing a friend's money or, you know, who's basically, you know, breaking down pieces of the community because they just don't know their business. And, yeah. Uh, it, it, it was a very interesting experience to see the parallels between the two industries. Uh, I mean, to jump feet first into fitness like that was pretty was pretty cool. I was glad I had Randy by my side because he's a tough character to deal with, oh, uh, yeah. especially on camera. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, a quick look on your IMDb shows that you've, you've actually been involved in a few shorts and movies for 2015. Can we expect to see uh, Frank Shamrock coming to the big screen in the coming years? You know, I have a couple of projects that we're working on, and I'm sort of slowly evolving into an executive producer guy. Mm. Um, which which more just means I'm putting the shows and the deals together that I want to do. Um, and I started doing the same in fighting at the end of my fighting career, really, you know, getting the promotion, getting the opponent, like getting the story, getting the media. Um, so now we're just doing it at a different level for television and for film. So, yeah, I think this year you're going to see a little, uh, a few projects. Uh, the last one that we just did through my new production company was the uh, Mike Tyson a uh, glory countdown we literally show. watched that yesterday we, that's great that's really yeah. good that was your, that yeah, was your was company cool, right wow yeah yeah that was my that was my company and my boy lee simons he pulled the whole thing together for uh for the glory brand to really try to take it to the next level and then tonight mike's gonna actually commentate for the first time ever uh over glory kickboxing with my uh, talent team Stephen quadros and mauro ronaldo at the live glory show tonight so mm. it's kind of uh, a whole package for them and that's where my, my hat has sort of fallen these days because I'm, I'm too old to be beating people up and, you know, the teaching really hurts my back and stuff. So I do that selectively, and the rest of it is try to produce television and ideas that promote martial arts, mixed martial arts, and the benefits of a lifestyle like that. Well, speaking of the crazy world of mixed martial arts, Frank, you know, the big news this week was Anderson Silva testing positive you know, to PEDs, you know, as someone who's being looked up to as a legend, such as yourself in the sport, you know, what were you, what were your thoughts when you heard the news? Were you shocked like the rest of us? Yeah. I mean, I, I was shocked, but I mean, it's been, 
like 10 years now that I've been shocked. I think we were the only sport that allowed athletes to actually do steroids legally. And I don't even know what that was about. Um, but yeah, I mean, it appears like the new generation is just, you know, throw the rules aside, make your money. Um, you know, the, the idea of sort of living by the rules and honor and respect has kind of been tossed out the window. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even know what to say about it because, you know, I mean, back in the day, which is, gee, I realize it's been some time now, um, you know, it was about the game and it was about winning the game and the rules, you know, finding the way, finding the, the solution, finding the shot, finding the, the technique, finding the position. Um, and now it seems like it's about something else. You know, it's about the, you know, the, the gimmick, the drug, the thing. And it's like, the sad part is I, I can't, you know, I can't turn it on for my daughter. You mm. know, I can't share with her the, the sport that I built because it's like, she's like, okay, I don't understand. He's on drugs and <laughs> uh, wow. like, I can't even, I can't even, I can't even explain it. Um, and that to me, you know, that concerns me because this is supposed to be martial arts. This is supposed to be, you know, how we lead a generation as sports heroes. And, you know, I can't even turn on for my daughter. That, that part just, it just blows me away. It just blows me away. Yeah, it definitely is a huge shame. I think Anderson's one of those guys where no one ever suspected him. And I think now a lot of the f MMA fans, it's kind of like telling him Santa's not real. Like if Anderson, you know, tests a positive, every, all the people on the internet are like, well, you know, everyone must be on it. You know, I'm wondering, Frank, you know, is it is this the kind of thing where the new generation or is, is it's a new thing where a lot of guys are now doing it? Or is this just a case where it's always been there and now the testing is just showing that it's always been there? You know, it's always been there, but now the culture is like, it's better to get caught than X. So it's just different now. You know, before it's like you went down that path, you know, that was a, that was a choice. You were a cheater. You were, you know, you were bending the limits. And I didn't mind fighting those guys because they, they were never in the right state of mind. You know, they were never focused and cheat out and had a martial vision because they were on something else. So I didn't mind it. Uh, and I thought it was a benefit going into a fight. Like when I thought Baroni, when I thought, you know, giant dudes, I was like, yeah, let them be all crazy and, you know, out of their mind and also nervous, you know, because if you're not putting the time at the gym and you need a tool like that, then you know it, you know it in your heart and soul. So, you know, for me, it's just like, it's a personal choice. And now I think the personal choice is too easy to make, you know, and there's no, Nothing's going to happen to these guys. They're going to make millions of dollars. They're like, yep, sorry. Sorry, fans, I led you astray. It's like, <laughs> dude, that's not, that's not what it's supposed to be about. You know, Michael Jordan didn't do that stuff. But, you know, you know, we want to be taken seriously as a sport. We need heroes that stand above the arm. And it's like, until we get there, it's like we're going to be, you know, the guy fighting in a cage in a dang spandex. That's a great point, Frank. And, you know, you, you've got an amazing legacy. Casper mentioned people thought Santa Claus died when they heard the Anderson Silver news. Do you think this tarnishes Anderson's legacy in the long run? Do you think it might overshadow some of the great things that he's done in the sport? Um, sadly, probably no. <laughs> wow. That, that, may be the worst, that may be the worst part. It's, I, it's now so common. And so, oh, yeah, oh, gosh, there it is. Um, you know, people think that's what our sport's about. People think we're a bunch of dudes on steroids with tattoos fighting in a cage. Mm. And that's, I mean, I was at Congress speaking about this, you know, 10, 15 years ago going, we're not those people. Uh, but somehow we're those people. Like, that's what our culture is producing. And I just, I don't see an end to it. I don't know how we stop it. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, how do you say to Anderson Silva, look, oh, you're in the wrong on this one. Mm. because it's now it's indicative of our culture this is what they do this is what we do you know john john does cocaine and silva does it's like what really you know i i came from a school where you you trained hard in martial arts you know you you follow the rules you studied the rule book and you found a way to win you know at whatever cost and it's like those days are done yeah, I mean, I want to I want to bring up something that you said years ago. You know, after you fought Nick in two thousand nine, you mentioned that it felt to you like the passing of the torch. You know, like you passed the torch to Nick. What do you think about the fact that he may be retiring again, especially after failing another drug test due to marijuana? <laughs> I, I I mean, I just think it's sad that that is the future generation. 
that you know Nick Diaz is the future. You know, there's a million kids going. I want to be like Nick, and it's like you don't want to be like Nick. Um, you know, and I, I just don't think there's any forethought to it. You know, I, I came up as a martial artist, and it may have been accidental. Like I may have accidentally been, you know, dragged down or pushed down or guided down the martial arts path. But at the end of the journey, or in the middle of a journey, however you want to look at it, I can see what works and what doesn't. Um, and that, you know, the minute you you sell your soul, the minute you you know do steroids, the minute you you know you you break the rules in such a way that you can't come back. It's like, you know, then it just changes who you are, and then your fan base and your everything changes. And it's like now the whole generation has changed. Um, and the craziest thing was, I mean, I felt it when I was fighting Keto Ortiz. I could feel that they wanted him to win. And that was in 1999 because mm. he was a bad boy. He was a this guy. He was a that guy. You know, he was a flipper offer guy. I could feel it. I was like, wow, this is, you know, what an amazing, weird feeling that they want this, you know, perception of a bad person to win. Um, and then when I fought Nick Diaz, you know, I felt it was in the first minute. Like they were like, yeah, yeah Frank Gold, we need to get rid of him. <laughs> we like this guy. Wow. Um, but it's a public perception. It's what it's what society is looking for right now. And right now, it's okay to do drugs. It's okay to do steroids. It's okay to do this and do that. It's perfectly okay. And we're the sport that says it's okay. And it's like at the end of the day, you know, that just saddens me. You know, because that's not that's not what I'm teaching my children. And that's not what I was taught. And that's not what I believe. Certainly, you know, there's a few things going on in the world in MMA. One of the other things we wanted to get your thoughts on was, you know, one of your good friends, Kung Lee, is one of the original fighters be behind the UFC lawsuit that's happening right now. You know, we never did get an opportunity to get your thoughts on it. What do you think about this whole situation, this whole UFC lawsuit? Well, I mean, I think it's a long time coming. You know, they have organically monopolized the industry. Um, you know, and many may say with a you know, course of business that they grew this way. I, I certainly think and know that their intentions were malicious, that their direction was defined. But, you know, it's a course of business. They've grown big enough to where, you know, you can throw giant rockets at them and, and antitrust lawsuits. And, you know, most certainly their structure of business should be examined and investigated because it seems that it's controlling an entire industry and monopolizing its revenue streams towards them. I know with these lawsuits, you know, they usually take a long time. What do you What do you think? Do you think the this, this will actually make a big difference? Do you think the Kung Lee and, you know, all the other guys that are suing the UFC, do you think they have a chance of winning, or do you think the UFC are too powerful? I don't know. At this point, you know, I mean, the right now I think the challenges are, you know, proving that the structure right now is, you know, a controlling structure and sort of a built, in their fashion, so they always win. Uh, that's really hard to prove. And then secondary, I think, you know, they want to try to prove that the the actual process of business was wrong. Mm. You know, that you can't monopolize talent and control their likeness and in perpetuity. That you can't continue to milk them, you know, after they're done uh, without some type of compensation. Uh, and, and that was my original beef and concern with the UFC in the first place. Gosh, back in 1999. Mm. You know, it's like every other town, every other mm -hmm. artist, they don't control you forever and ever and be able to monetize you. At some point, you can have that back and continue to build on the assets that you've created. Um, and, and, you know, with the UFC and with other promotions in this industry, they control everything forever. Uh, so your ability to make money is only that night. That's it. And then you're, you're on to the next thing. Hey, I wanted to also ask you, you know, with Kung, obviously the thing that b before the actual lawsuit happened, obviously it was because of his retirement, you know, what was it like having such a history with Kung Lee in Strike Force, you know, in San Jose, you know, the two of you guys actually fought, what was it like seeing him retire? I mean, it was bittersweet. I enjoyed his style. Um, and, I, you know, as far as Kung was the guy that really taught me stand up, you know, in range and everything. Because I, I was his sparring partner for years before we fought, um, and he was beat on me because I didn't really know that much about striking. I was sort of learning the whole thing. Um, so I have a lot of ring time with Kung, and I have a lot of experience and a lot of respect for him and his style. Because his style is, uh, you know, a lot of the moves he does are are very effective, but they go against the biomechanics of the body. So they mm. use a lot of energy. They're very dynamic. Um, 
and you know, I could always tell with his style that you know it was like a it's like my style. It was a young man's style based on athleticism and angles and stuff. Uh, so I could always tell the age was going to catch up with him like it did to me. Uh, so I just loved his career and the way he's manipulated and um, you know used his martial arts to manipulate the game of MMA. Uh, and I have tremendous respect for him. It was sad to see him go, but you know it's like when you get older, you don't want to hurt no more. Now, Frank, we just want to change. We just want to change directions because we know we only have a few minutes left. We really want to hear about this incident, actually, la- a lack thereof. You know, uh, we everybody's heard the story, but we're not sure if the MMA fans have heard it yet. So we just want to ask you about it. When Mickey Rourke apparently flew you and a couple of other guys down to the WWE a few years ago, you know, Mickey had a big part in WrestleMania against Chris Jericho, who's a wrestler for any MMA fans who weren't sure. And Mickey was legitimately mad at Chris Jericho about the things that he said about, to him on Larry King. Now, you were apparently one of the enforcers that he brought down in case anything got physical. You know, is this true? And you can, can you tell us a little bit about exactly what happened? Yeah, totally. Well, you know, Mickey's a good friend of mine. So when um, when he got the call to do WrestleMania, he thought that there was a good chance they might double cross him. Like jump him or this or that or whatever. Because he's like, hey, he's old school. He's like in the street. He's mm. like a real dude, hardcore. Mm. So... He calls me up and he's like, what's the man? He's like, I got my film career going again. I had the wrestlers up for these awards and everything. He's like, there's no way I can go down like this. He's like, if they pull something mm-hmm. on me, I need, I need some backup. So uh, he's like, bring, you know, he's like, I want you to come out and I want you to bring just a killer with you, like just in case. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I brought, so, so I flew out, um, went out to his uh, big pad in, uh, in Hollywood, and then we also got on uh, Vince's private jet, and I brought uh, Clint Coronel, who's the Aztec. He's like a Golden Gloves boxer, an MMA fighter, and just hardcore-looking dude. Wow. And, um, you know, he's Mickey serious. Like, he didn't understand that it was a gimmick that Jericho was, you know, using as a promotional tool. Mm. Um, you know, Mickey's like, hey, he's from the street. So if you say, hey, I want to, you know, hey, I'm calling you out, it's like, oh, we need to deal with this. You know, before yeah. it goes somewhere else. So he thought it was real. He thought they were going to have an altercation. He didn't know what the end result was going to be. And um, and he brought some forces, and I was in that group. So, yeah, it was crazy. I'd never been to WrestleMania. It was, like, one of my childhood dreams. Um, and then, you know, within, like, two weeks, we're on Vince's plane. I'm sitting there ringside. The whole thing's happening. And I was just like, wow, what a crazy experience. That's insane. Well, you know, I read that when you were a kid, you know, you didn't watch too much TV other than boxing and pro wrestling. What was it like being there? And, you know, what was your experience like with Vince? Apparently, and this is what Jerrica says, apparently Vince was like, oh, you know, you, you take Mickey and I'll take I'll take the short guy, which, you know, you were allegedly that short guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I, you know, they have their own world going on. Uh, we came in like hot and heavy and we're going to we're gonna do some serious damage. But the whole thing, like, we figured out, I figured all along that it was, you know, pro wrestling. And that's what you do. You build up a gimmick and then you work it out. Um, but Mickey was so convinced and so on edge that, uh, you know, we uh, we stood in line like good soldiers. But, yeah, they were, honestly, they were like, uh, what 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 brings him up down here? <laughs> I just got this scary guy with him. It was totally... Um, a weird like uh, situation, and but once they sat down and broke it down and kind of went through the whole thing, and then Vince and all those guys got in the ring, worked it out, and you know everybody felt good about it. And I was just like a kid. I mean, I'm like, are you kidding me? And all this is happening uh, right around me, and so I was pretty neat. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of the world of professional wrestling, you know, your brother Ken, just quickly touching on this because we know you have to go. Your brother Ken, you know, he's actually going to be taking on a bare knuckle legend, James Quinn, uh, sometime in 2015. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. You know, did you, what did you think when you heard that he's going to be doing a bare knuckle boxing match? And, you know, James Quinn, he's a pretty well known guy. You know, who, who would win a bare knuckle boxing match between those two, in your opinion? I I don't know. I mean, when I first heard about it, I thought it was a joke, like a media thing, or a media hook or something. But um, yeah, I mean, it looks like he's intent on doing. It. I think it's I think it's kind of crazy. Um, but I mean, I don't know. Who knows what I'll be doing when I'm like fifty one, fifty two? I might get some crazy, <laughs> you know, desire to go jump off a mountain or something crazy like that. Um, I hope it's not because he needs money. You know, I hope he's taking care of his business and stuff and. And this is what he's doing in his, you know, spare time. Mm. Um, but who knows? You know, who knows? I, I think by looking at the industry, like I said earlier, the money flows go one, you know, goes one way. So 
I think we're going to see a lot of guys like Ken, you know, a lot of guys like John Fry and just the older generation. There's just no more money. You know, there's no more physical being. There's no more ability to work. There's no more, and you know, there's nothing for them. Um, you know, and in a real sports industry, there's, there's a layer built there, you know, to where those guys are honored and taken care of and can support and, you know, participate in the industry. Well, for now, I know that you said that, uh, for now, it's good to hear that seminars and hiking are your thing, uh, Frank. If you ever do decide to take on <laughs> bare knuckle or anything, we'll definitely be excited to see it. Guys, don't forget to follow Frank on Twitter at Frank Shamrock or visit his website, frankshamrock.com, uh, for more information about his upcoming seminars. We're super excited. 2015 is going to be a great year, Frank. And as always, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, if I ever decide to do bare knuckle, you guys better call me and talk me out of it. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll we'll call you and have you on the show and we'll help you promote it buddy. <laughs> I, might, I, might, I might pay you a couple hundred bucks if I could be the water boy you know? yeah. that'll, be, that'll be the best moment of my life yeah. I'm, gonna, so- I'm gonna lean on you guys no I'm gonna lean on you guys to call me and be like okay this is crazy I need you to put down the bottle of beer and move forward well we've got it recorded now so we'll just play this back to you and be like remember what, remember what you said that's you saying it to us Frank but yeah we, we know you have to go so, so we'll let you go always a pleasure chatting to you Frank and um, good luck in your conference alright thanks guys what's up guys this is Joseph Benavidez UFC flyweight and you're listening to Submission Radio Alright guys, our next guest, he is the man behind the boxing of Nick and Nate Diaz and the man who has helped them reach the success that they have today. He is the legendary boxing coach himself. He's none other than Richard Perez. Richard, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you going? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Casper. Oh, it's it's our pleasure to have you on the show today. It's great to chat to you. You know, before we talk about Nick's big fight, we want to know, you know, how did it all start and, you know, where did the Diaz brothers get their amazing boxing from? You know, how did you guys originally get together and how old were Nick and Nate? Uh, Nick and Nate, it was in 2004. The age, I can't really remember, but that was in 2004 before Nick fought Robbie Lawler. That's when I started training in, in the boxing. Wow. You know, it's interesting, Richard, because Nick and Nate, they're very obviously very tough and they work very hard to have the skills that they do. But, you know, I heard a huge part of that is thanks to you. You know, before they met you, what were the guys like in the striking department and what was it like, you know, kicking it off from scratch with them? Uh, they were they were okay. I mean, they weren't really uh, uh, what you call good boxers. I mean, they, they would throw punches, believe me, you know, but they, uh, especially Nick, uh, he would, you know, get hit a lot. And uh, Nathan was more, a little more movement, you know, more, more, more of a blue boxer, better. Uh, but Nick would just stand there and just bang with you. And uh, you know, you famously said that in 2004, this is around the Robbie, yeah. the Robbie Lawler fight. You saw how great Nick could be. You know, this is before he fought Robbie Lawler. When you look at him now, over 10 years later, do you think he's reached that potential and become as great as you had envisioned? Yes. The thing about uh, training people, you know, like Nick and Nathan, anybody is that uh, they improve all the time when I train them. There's always something they, they get better at. And uh, like you know, you know, Nick threw the most punches in the fight. You know, but when he fought Robbie Lawler, he was a big underdog. And he came and asked me, would you train me for boxing? And I said, yeah. And uh, we started training. And uh, I was really, uh, like, surprised because the way he fought, that he listened to me very well, and he went out there and did what I told him to do. I mean, I wasn't there. But uh, he didn't get careless. He boxed really good, and that's why that's why he won the victory. You know, Nick it sends a lot of mixed messages. You know, he's recently said that he doesn't enjoy fighting. However, we've read interviews with you where you've talked about how often Nick and Nate would call you up and get down to the gym and train. You know, do you think the guys are still as passionate about fighting as they were in the past? Do you think they're as passionate as they were, Richard? Well, sure there is. I mean, I mean, he says he doesn't like fighting, but uh, he he must. I mean, because uh, I, I loved it. I mean, it's just still in my blood, so it has to be in your blood. And I, I mean, he's never told me he didn't like it, you know, that he didn't like fighting at all. So uh, I believe he does. And, you know, Richard, I want to go back in time a little bit, you know, before we talk about this big fight, you know, you have been obviously with Nick and Nate for so many years. You know, what is it that got you into boxing and uh, what made you want to be a trainer in general? Well, there's four brothers, there's four of us. And uh, my dad taught us how to fight when we were little. That's one of the first sports. I mean, I, that's what I, I remember doing the first time is just putting gloves on and boxing my brothers. I was the youngest. So I, obviously I was always getting beat up, but I learned. <clears throat> so when I go box other people, it was easier for me because 
I always box my brothers are older, stronger, and, and I learn a lot more. And when I go to box other people, it's like, wow, this is this is cool. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got started. Absolutely. You know, Richard, MMA boxing, you know, approaching that from a traditional boxing world can be difficult for so many trainers. You know, how different, because I know you train a lot of boxers and you also do train some MMA fighters such as Nick and Nate and Yancey. You know, how different is the training that you do with the MMA fighters compared to your traditional boxers? What would be the key differences? Uh, make them throw elbows. <laughs> That's the only difference. Yeah. Uh, just throwing... They did. I, I make them throw, you know, bo like boxing. They're boxing, but I make them throw elbows too. Well, they want to throw the elbows, so we do that too. The majority is, is punches. With boxing, obviously, all you, all you really have to worry about is the strikes, whereas in MMA, you have to worry about being taken down and put in the clinch and, you know, having someone throw knees at you in the clinch. So would that change the training in terms of what you guys do, or does it still stay the same for you? I'm there when they're doing MMA too, so, but my main thing is boxing, so... Yeah, uh, what I do is, you know, when I'm in the ring and I'm working with them on the mitts or, and uh, I'm throwing punches at them and, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to throw like uppercuts, you know, trying to explain to them like it's like a knee, you know, uh, but other than that, uh, they, when they do kickboxing, I'm, I'm there trying to, you know, guide them to the same thing as, you know, watch the knee, watch the kicks, you know, step in, you know, just things like that. So it, it does help them out as far as the boxing from when they're doing kickboxing. The takedowns, now that's different. That's their their that's it's their way of fighting on the ground. I don't you know, I try to give them a little a little bit of coaching but not too much. Well what what I mean is though, like with, with obviously boxing, like you would train a certain way uh, you know, to throw strikes without the worry of the takedown. I'm just saying, like, when you teach the guys boxing, would you teach them to box a certain way, uh, you know, in a way to, say, avoid the takedown? Not not to say that you teach them takedown defense, but just, oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I teach them, no. No, boxing's the same. I mean, I, I focus on just boxing, and that makes them better, because if I try to work with other things, it throws them off. So, and, and anybody. So that's why I get, once I get them, and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're in my territory, and they're focused on just boxing. And obviously your territory is amazing. Now, you know, last weekend, one of your star pupils, Nick Diaz, he put in a great performance against Anderson Silva. You know, however, Nick mentioned due to a mix-up, you weren't in his corner. We're just wondering, what, what happened, Richard? Why weren't you there? Well, what happened was, you know, uh, when he fought uh, his last fight, not this one, Anderson Silva, but when he fought uh, George St. Pierre, I didn't get my percentage on the pay. And uh, I I don't know what happened with the mix-up with the manager and Nick, and then so he let he let the other manager go, and he hired this other man named Lloyd as a new manager, and they met in my gym, and you know we made it, we made it negotiate it, you know, for the purse, and and asked for a contract, and they said it was fine. And it was in October, so then I uh, started training Nick, and I kept calling the, the Lloyd, and I wasn't getting no contract. So I just felt like, you know, if I, the, I think it was around the 12th of February, uh, January, I decided, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore because I don't want to get burned. So I text Lloyd and told him that I'm not going to do this. I'm going to say, get my contract, like you promised me. And that's what happened. It was just, a, you know, it was, it, it, they didn't want to give me the contract. So I felt like, you know, I didn't want to get burned again. Well, yeah, so I guess I did. Wow, yeah, so that, that, that's a major... It's sad. It's, yeah, it's sad because I brought him all the way up to the top, to, and this is what they talk about, is striking, and he gets a, 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 a... This guy is a legend, and he gets a big pay, and then um, I'm being pushed aside, so, you know, well, it's, that's what happens, so... Yeah, I'm hurt about it, you know, and it's sad because you have a relationship with a guy, teaching him how to do something that he doesn't know, and you bring him to the top, and he breaks the record, throwing the most punches, and all of a sudden, I'm out, so... Yeah. Um, so, Richard, just to just to be clear, does this mean will you be working with Nick in the future? Has Nick spoken to you at all about rectifying the situation? You know, do you see, see yourself I'm working with him in future fights? I haven't heard from either one of them, the manager or Nick. Oh, no. wow. So, yeah, it's sad. It really is, you know, because I've never had that problem before, never. And uh, as far as anybody I know that's can train boxers or any, never had that problem before. I mean, that I know of. I mean, there probably is, but. <clears throat> it's not like this is. I mean, come on. This is not. This is. This is. I don't know. It's. It's upsetting. Very upsetting. I was just saying. You know, it's like you know, bringing up a, a 
I brought him up. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, and and I did everything for him. I tried. I, I I put all everything I know in boxing into him, so he, so he can learn it and do it right. And so he broke the record and throwing those punches. And then he broke his own record of throwing those punches. So that's what brought him up there. You know, I mean, I know he's got he's good jujitsu. Nobody wants to go on the ground with him. So where does the left stand up? Mm. Absolutely, Richard. You know, and just wondering, you mentioned how he brought in his lawyers. You know, what was your relationship like with Nick then? And, you know, with these people in his ear, now that he started making, you know, the huge money, do you think it kind of changed him a little bit? Was that one of the factors, do you think, that affected the whole situation? I don't know. I really don't know what what the problem is and what, what went through his mind or anything, but I text both of them and let them know that I'm no longer going to train. I'm sorry. And uh, if I don't get my contract, and I sent it to Nick, too, I said, Nick, it's the, the ball's in your court, so it's your decision. And I told Lord that, too. And uh, the hardest part of, you know, training pros is to do, is dealing with managers, you know. Mm. And uh, the ma- the fighters in there have a problem because they, they always talk to the manager and say, hey, pay Richard, you know. So it they, they always, they always went through. But this one, it just didn't seem to work, so... Wow, we're really sorry to hear that, Richard. Um, I'm curious because you say he texted both of them. I'm assuming you're meaning Nick and Lloyd. Does it, is does this yeah. mean the same thing for Nate? Are you still training with Nate Diaz, or, or what's happening with that? Okay, Nate is totally different. He's day and night. Mm. He's he's always got my back because he he appreciates what I do for him. You know, he he knows that I I, I teach him really good in boxing. He knows I got him in that boxing position. You know, throwing good punches because he broke uh, Nick's record in throwing those punches. Mm. when he fought Cowboy. Mm. So, you know, uh, but Nathan always takes care of me. Never, He's never let me down. None of my fighters have ever let me down. This is the first time. Wow. Um, wow. You, Richard, you know, that, that's, a, that's a developing story there. And, you know, thank you for telling us that. You know, I just wanted to get your thoughts on last weekend. Obviously, you had worked with Nick a little bit going into that one. You know, what were your thoughts on his performance against Anderson? Were you impressed at all? Well, I figured, I, this is what I, I figured, you know, I, I I almost had him where he wanted to be. We had like a week and a half to go left, and I was going to go full force with him. But where I stopped, I felt like he would do fine. He, well, I, didn't, I, didn't, I knew he wasn't going to throw a lot of punches. I knew that. But I figured he would catch Anderson Silva. But since Anderson Silva was on steroids, it's hard to knock people out when they're on steroids. You know, it's hard to really, you know... Uh, wear him down but if, if, if I would have worked him a little bit more that we can have I guarantee you would have stopped him yeah if you, I would have been there coaching him if I have been there coaching him it would have made a big difference too but before we talk about Anderson no. Silva's steroid test, you know, you you mentioned you knew he wasn't going to throw a lot of punches. Uh, you know, we're, I'm fascinated by that. Why was he not going to throw punches? It, it seems very unlike Diaz. What was the game plan behind that? What's that? You said that Nick, you knew Nick Diaz wasn't going to throw a lot of punches. Why? Why was he not going to throw a lot of punches? Oh, because he, I didn't quite have him there at that peak yet. I needed that. I needed the rest of the week and a half to get there, and I knew what it got. It. I knew what it had him there. Because the way I train, uh, I'll go, you know, five, six rounds on the miss with him, five minute rounds, mm. and that's constantly. I mean, throwing combinations, me throwing a him back. You know, I got to be careful not to get hit. It's just, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's I, got, I got him thrown like a machine, you know, and, and that's what stops people. If they don't want, if they don't, he can't take the punches, they go to the ground, he taps them out. Mm. Yeah, so that's, that's the whole key. I knew, I knew, and then me not being there, you know, counting, you know, trying to help him out on what to do, how, what to throw, what to set up, it, it, he, he was on his own. One of the strange techniques that Nick implemented in this fight, and I'm wondering if um, if you knew anything about this technique or could explain it to us, Richard, was he would take his elbow out and point it out, and I think it was in the first couple of rounds of the fight. wasn't very sure exactly what he was doing. Do you have any kind of explanation about what, what that technique is? We've never uh, actually seen that one before. Doing yeah, what? So he was taking his elbow and he was pointing it out. He was sort of in his boxing stance, and then he was just pointing oh, his elbow out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. About. He does that sometimes. That's I don't like him doing it, but he does it. He puts <laughs> his elbow out there in front. I don't know why he does that, and uh, I I I have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I guess we don't either. I'm not I'm not even sure if Nick does. You know, when this fight was announced, you know, Anderson had this big aura about him for so many years. You know, I'm just curious when this fight was announced. What were your initial thoughts when you looked at both guys' styles? 
when they first announced them fighting. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I knew Nick would have it in the bag because I was going to train him all the way to the, to the, you know, to the fight, but it didn't happen. So, see, and then see, if you if you see now and you notice that I didn't train him full the full amount, and plus I wasn't there, he was kind of like lost. But yet he went to decision, and even Anderson still was on steroids. Nick. Oh, it, I tell you, what, they're totally different. If, if I would have been trained all the way through, I don't care if Nick if, if Anderson was on steroids because the amount of punches that Nick would have been throwing on him, it, it, he he wouldn't be able to handle it. You know, one of the one of the big things to come out was also you know Nick testing positive for marijuana. Having worked with the guy for you know over, over ten years, you know, were you surprised at all by by these findings? Do you think it's something that sort of got in his way when it came to his athletic career? I didn't know. He, I really didn't think he was going to be uh, for steroids. I mean, for marijuana. I didn't think he was going to do that, but I guess he did. So, I mean, he does it. Uh, I guess he does it sometimes, and sometimes he doesn't. I don't know. I mean, I'm not with him 24-7, so even when I'm there at the fight, you know, we're uh, there like three, four days before the fight, I'm not around him all the time, so I don't know when he did it, you know. So I can't. I can't answer that. So, I mean, I just do what I best I can do and remind him, you know, to not do it until after the fight. You want to do whatever you want at the fight, that's fine. But I don't know if somebody convinces him or they pull it out or something and he's there. I don't know. And, you know, I mean, the biggest thing with that test is, and I guess, you know, marijuana, a lot of people have mixed opinions on it. But just the fact that it looks like Nick is going to have to miss a large amount of time from fighting. And he had to do that previously again because of the other test that he tested positive for. Do you think that's a shame that it's going to keep him out of fighting again for a while because of him testing positive? Possibly even worse than Anderson Silva with this whole steroid thing. Well, it might. You never know. I mean, uh, well, Anderson Silva, uh, 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 Nevada, they uh, took the win away from Anderson Silva because of the steroids on against Nick. So that's that's good for Nick. You know, I mean... But uh, the the marijuana, uh, I don't know what they're gonna do. Uh, the marijuana it doesn't it doesn't do good for you in the fight. It's yeah. not uh, like steroids. It's not like it doesn't affect you, make you stronger or you know faster or anything. It just makes you like slow. You know. I mean, I don't. But I I feel I think he did it like maybe eight days before, nine days, ten days or whatever. Cause it takes a while to clear. Mm. So I don't know. You know, it could have been three days. I don't know. So. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, but I would assume there's a big difference between you know marijuana before a fight and steroids. You know, what do you, what were your thoughts? You know, Anderson Silva for a long time has been considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time, and then the steroid test pops up for not one but two types of uh, you know, there's t- traces of two steroid metabolites. What were your, what was your initial reaction? Were you surprised like everyone else? I was surprised, but I thought I thought figuring out maybe it's because that he broke the bone and they replaced it, and they wanted him to develop faster, you know, heal faster. Mm. And I don't know if he ever did it before, but I figured maybe this I give him, I give him the benefit of the doubt that maybe they used it because they wanted him to get going, you know, and get uh, heal faster, and you know, get to work in fact, get you know, start training and get strong and get back to where you know he was. I guess I don't know. I that uh, that's my guess. Absolutely, Richard. You know, with a guy like Anderson Silva, do you think a test like this sort of puts his legacy into question? Oh yeah, because if he didn't come in with steroids, even though Nick wasn't throwing a lot of punches, Nick would have stopped him. And I know it would have been different. And just in terms of the, it always f- a big difference. It make a big difference. And I was, I'm just curious, you know, just between watching Anderson Silva fight before and, you know, years prior to watching him now after such a long layoff and obviously the horrific injury he suffered, you know, what what did you think of his performance in general? Do you think he looked like the old Anderson? Do you think, you know, he still had it? No, he he, he slowed down a lot. You know, he on this fight, he slowed down a lot. And I don't know if it was the steroids, you know, I don't, because, you know, or just the, the long layoff, the leg. I don't know. You know, I, I, there's it, it, there's three things that you know you can focus on those. You know, and that's the long lay off the leg and the steroids. You know, Richard, you and Nick and Nate, and you know, obviously you've been in the combat industry for so many years. 
Nick was in Pride, which is you know notorious for people juicing and using PEDs. When you when you've gotten one of your guys ready before, have you ever thought, man, you know this guy he seems a bit sus because all these steroid tests they're all coming positive now. But what fans are wondering is, has this always been going on in the industry, or is it something that just starting to happen now? I think it has been happening a lot because I've seen some guys that had muscles on their back that I've never seen before. <laughs> you know, like, like, uh, like, don't get me wrong, but like George St. Pierre, he was bulky. And when we went to the weigh in, Nick was, you know, trying to cut the weight to get to the, to 170. And they came up to us and told not, not George St. Pierre, but the, the ones that are in charge of the, of the weigh in or the UFC said, uh, George St. Pierre is a pound and a half over and he's not going to lose the weight. Mm. And that made Nick mad. That made Nick mad. You know, that's not right. So he came in over. So, you know, he wasn't he wasn't going to uh, try to cut down. That's wrong. But see, they don't they don't tell it to the media. You know, they they you know, and uh, and Nick said, why is he going to why can't he cut the weight? He goes, he's George St. Pierre. Well, the, come on, mm. that, you know, it makes me mad because, you know, they hide stuff sometimes for uh, the fighters. But yet, if Nick smokes weed or does something, they make a big deal out of it. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to stick up for him. But I'm just saying, you know, they should be all equal. You know, it's a, it's a world title fight. George St. Pierre should have been on the money. Cut, should, he should have had to cut the weight, and he didn't. You know, here's George, here's Anderson Silva coming in with steroids, two different types. And, you know, I mean, okay, so they, they take the, the win away from him, but what else are they going to do? Is that it? Mm. And Nate got busted for marijuana. What are they going to do to him? You know, who's going to be punished more? Because they look at Nick, he's a bad guy as far as fighting. I'm not trying to stick up for him. I'm just, I just feel that everybody should be treated the same way. Yeah, no, I, I understand completely where you're coming from. And I remember that video leaking of, uh, you know, I think someone was recording when the commission actually came up to you guys and talked about GSP not making weight. You know, with yes. Nick, with, with Nick, you know, uh, after his last fight, you know, he retired. And I believe there was a, another semi-retirement prior to that. And now he says he might be retiring again. What are your thoughts? Do you think Nick will will disappear? Do you think this is his last fight? Do you think we'll see him in boxing? Well, he's got two more fights, so I know I'm pretty sure he'll do the two more fights. I don't think he's just going to stop right now. I think he's just disappointed because of, of overall everything, you know. Mm. <clears throat> Absolutely, Richard. Now let's talk about your other star pupil, Nate Diaz. You mentioned that you have a, diff a completely different relationship with him. You know, Nate made a return to the UFC. However, his performance, obviously, you know, it wasn't exactly what you guys wanted. How's training going with Nate now? And you know, what did you think about his return to the UFC? What did you think about his uh, performance when he returned to the UFC? Oh, well, Nate, Nate trains really hard, but see, no one really knows. Like when he fought uh, ben, Benson Henderson, he hurt his back. He was cutting weight, and this manager wanted to go in there and spar with this 200-pound guy, and he, they fell down, and Nick hurt his, Nathan hurt his back, so he couldn't train for nine days. And we only had like 13, 14 days left before the fight, so he couldn't really do anything, and he didn't do much in the fight. But he made the distance. He went the distance. Mm. And then when he fought Ross Thompson... You know, they were taking him away from me all the time, and then uh, his weight got over, he was overweight, you know, he wasn't, I don't know what happened, but anyway, he tried to lose a bunch of weight before the fight, and it kind of messed him up, so it, he wasn't right there either, and that hurt him, you know, and so then, when he fought his last fight here, he hurt his ribs, like uh, two weeks before the fight, and we really couldn't train that much, you know, he when you hurt your ribs, you can't throw punches, you can't do anything, you can't even breathe, mm. you know? So, you know, he gained some weight, and he, he couldn't he couldn't lose it, so he went to the, the fight, he wasn't going to back out. That's one thing about Nick and Nate, they will not back out, no matter what. And uh, it, it hurts, you know? And that's that's why he looked bad in those three fights, that when he's okay and nobody's bothering us, interrupting us, and we're training, he comes out like lightning. I mean, you can see it. Yeah, well, one thing I'm curious about is because we've had uh, Nate's manager on, on the show quite a few times and we've been talking about the long layoff and things like that. You know, did you still train Nate in between his long layoff when he didn't fight for, I think it was al almost a year or it was at least quite a while. Did you still train Nate in the, in the interim? Yes. Oh, yes, we still, we still hook up. 
And I mean, the big question is, Richard, you know, going into 2015, you know, what, what are you expecting from Nate Diaz um, in that octagon? Obviously, you mentioned you guys are working very, very hard. You know, are you guys looking to make a big run at it in 2015? Well, I, I hope so. I mean, that's, you know, we always look at that. We always look at it that way. That's our goal, you know, yeah. to work hard and win. Oh, absolutely. Now, something else that I wanted to talk to you about, you know, we were looking through, I believe it was your Facebook, uh, Richard Perez 209, and uh, we saw some interesting photos. It was uh, UFC uh, Hall of Famer Ken Shamrock went down to your gym, Richard Perez Boxing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, uh, you know, this is pretty cool. What was it like having Ken in the gym? You know, what was he doing there? Did you guys do any training? <laughs> you know what's funny about that is that I wasn't there. Oh, all wow. days, <laughs> I, I had to go train Nick in Concord. Yeah. And uh, he came in. He was asking for me, and I wasn't there. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. I went to go train Nick. I was getting ready for this Anderson Silva fight, and I missed him. Mm. I wish I would have been there, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. Now, Richard, you know... <laughs> One one of the one of the big things for yourself personally was that you did open a new school. I believe it was mid last year. Um, just wondering, you know, for the fans listening around the world, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the facility and you know what was the inspiration behind opening it? Well, my, my wife and I talked about it. You know, we've always wanted to open up a boxing gym. And you know what's funny is that uh, we would drive by buildings, you know, vacant buildings, and say, hey, there's there's that's going to be our gym. And we would laugh, you know, because I never thought I was going to do it. I wanted to. That was my dream, but I never thought I did until I ran into this building over here in Manteca on Main Street. And that we opened it. We decided to, to take a chance and open it up. And I didn't think I was going to get a lot of people. I'm, I've been open for seven months, and I have over 140 people. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. We're super happy for your success, Richard. Uh, we're going to do something fun with you just to just to wrap up the interview. It's called the Submission Rated Tap Out Round. We just ask you a few fun questions and you answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Sure. All righty. Give us your favorite boxer of all time, Richard. Who's shooting savage? Give us the official Richard Perez prediction. Pacquiao versus Mayweather. If it ever does happen, who wins it and how? Pacquiao. I don't know if it's going to be a kid or a decision, but it, I, I, I go for Pacquiao. I, I uh, believe he'll Pacquiao. Do okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, apart from Nick and Nate, who, in your opinion, is the best boxer in MMA right now? Besides Nick and Nate? Yeah. <laughs> or, I don't know. Well, if, if we're including Nick and Nate, do you think it would be the Diaz brothers? Yes. I, I believe it's the Diaz brothers. They can box. Richard, I want you to finish the sentence for us. People don't know that I... I'm a Christian. I, 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 you know, I follow God. That's what. That's why I'm here now. Uh, that's that's my number one goal. I mean, he's he's the one who brought me all the way to the top. Now, Richard, we know you're amazing. You're an amazing striker. But have Nick or Nate or any of your other MMA guys lured you into doing a bit of BJJ before? And how did you do? Yeah, I wrestled my freshman year, but I didn't do any tournaments. I was too heavy, so I just worked with the guys. And uh, I did really good. But uh, jiu-jitsu? No, I've never done jiu-jitsu. I mean, Nathan always said, come on, Rich. No, that's okay. <laughs> why, why is that? I'm I curious. Any, I don't want to break any bones. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, yeah. we're curious. You know, what's the best boxing movie of all time? Uh, what's that one? With, uh, it's an old, old movie. I can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, it's it's a black and white one. It's old. I can't remember which what it's called now. Is it got um, me there. <laughs> the one with Robert De Niro? Raging Bull. Raging Bull. Yes. Yes. See, we can we have we have mind reading powers, Richard. Now, <laughs> finally, you've done so much in your career. You've got a wonderful family and a fantastic gym. But speaking about your career in particular, what has been the proudest moment for you in your career thus far? What's a moment that you look back on? So far, you know, you've done so many amazing things and you think that is my proudest achievement thus far. Uh, just uh, giving the opportunity to train, to train people and teaching them and, and developing them and, and, and where, they're at, where they're at now, where they've been, like Rodney Jones, Tony Dominguez. Uh, there's other guys, you know, that, and, and, you know, like Rodney won the NABO, uh, NABO the uh, IMBF, uh, not the, uh, the NABF. <clears throat> you know, uh, and Nick won winning the Strike Force, you know, and Nathan went in the uh, five. Uh, the Ultimate uh, Fighter? Yes. Yep. So, and, and being where I'm at now, you know, opened up a gym and now I got kids coming up. Uh, they look good. Uh, they're doing very good. I mean, uh, who knows? I'm having a champion here, you know. 
So just uh, keeping healthy, you know, being being physically healthy, mentally, you know, that makes you feel good, really good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the next big thing may be fighting in, you know, may very well be training in gym. And guys, the opportunity is there. Check out richardperezboxing.com for more information on Richard's gym. And, of course, the address is 212, uh, I believe, North Main Street, Manteca, California. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Richard. We're here in Australia, so I'm not that familiar with the addresses there. Don't forget to check out uh, Richard on Facebook, Richard Perez 209 and, of course, Richard Perez Boxing on Facebook. Richard is it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Casper. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you guys giving me the time and the opportunity to talk to you. This is Diego Sanchez, and you're listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. And next guest is coming off another impressive win over Tim Bosch at UFC 183 via Arm Triangle. He has been named as the hottest fighter coming out of UFC 183 by Bleacher Report. Ladies and gentlemen, Talis Leites returns to Submission Radio. Talis, how are you? Welcome back to the show. Hey, how are you guys? Thanks for the opportunity to be here talking about my career and my last fight. Oh, man, oh, the, the pleasure is all ours. You always seem to impress us, impress us, Talos. I mean, your performance last weekend, it was just amazing. You know, we have to talk about it. You stood in the pocket and traded with a very, very dangerous powerhouse in Tim Boach. What was your game plan going into the fight? Was it to, imp- uh, to show off your improved striking? Yeah, sure. My game plan was fighting on stand and do and go fighting on stand to the end. And it was, you know, of course, I have my jiu-jitsu and he has his wrestling. I respect him a lot. He's a great fighter. But, you know, we were extending some punches and kicks. And we were seeing what, what was what will be. And I felt some punches and, uh, and uh, I put my plan B in, in, to work. And I took him down and used my jiu-jitsu. Hey, the plan B worked, you know. Tim often catches people with big punches like that that usually turn the tide of the fight. You know, he caught you with a big punch at one point. It looked like you were in danger for a moment. How much did the punch hurt you? Yeah, the first round, the end of the first round, I felt his big punch. He threw his body, all his body with his his hand, and you were ready. Mm. But, you know, he did it fast, and I didn't expect. When I felt, I, I received that punch, and it was a, a knockdown. I was on the on the ground and I I just hold his legs and I hear my 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 corner Andre Andre Pedernina he told me hey just relax it's 15 seconds to end of this round just relax and recover and what exactly what I did I was holding his leg and waiting for the the first round and the stuff that um, happened on the ground after you took him down, it was just a thing of pure beauty. It was picture perfect. For the fans that were watching that may not remember, you went for that triangle the first time. It didn't end up working out. Tim ended up getting out of it, and then you kept hunting for it, and get and you got it for the second time, switched sides, yeah. and finished it perfectly. Now, when you had him in that first one, was it just a case of you not wanting to rush it and just thinking, I'll, I'll keep him on the ground and I'll go for another one? And then what made yeah. you want to keep going for it? Yeah, uh, at the second round, we, the, the game plan was the same. But my, my coach, he told me, just relax, close the distance, and get him on the fence and uh, recover. But, you know, my blood was <laughs> was hot. And, uh, you know, when we at the second round, we started extending punches again, kicks. And then I felt the second punch, and, he, he you know, he did it. As, I received a, a straight punch, a strong and uh, as, as as soon as I get to the ground and, and I hold his legs and took him down, and I said, now I have to relax and use my jiu-jitsu step by step to try to submit him. And I was in half guard. I did a transition to the full guard, to the to the mountain. And and then I and I tried well, the first arm triangle, the katagatami. And he was I was hearing his breath really hard, but he is his warrior, and he was almost. I was sleeping, uh, but he did the, his last his last shot, mm. and uh, he he did a like a bridge, and he escaped it. But and I and I and I put it in my mind, and I had to be relaxed, and I back to the the mountain, and then I I did it the the, the other side. When I when I catch him on the other side, I said I put it in my mind. It's like a snake, a Brazilian snake, Jiboya is a famous <laughs> Brazilian snake. Yeah. When she, when the snake catch his, uh, his, uh, his opponent, 
she hold until the until the end until the his opponent sleep, you know, tight. And it's what exactly what I did when I hold him and that's the second katagatami I said, "Oh, I I won't move. I will be here until he tap or he sleep." <laughs> and I was just hearing him, you know, his breathing hard. Yeah. And then when and then come the uh, big John. I say, "Hey, hey, stop." And I said, oh, <laughs> one more mission, it is good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely awesome. And uh, we saw you celebrating, you were happy, you know, you uh, you sent out a message to your, to your daughter, obviously. You know, now you're, sure, on a huge, sure. you're on a huge eight-fight win streak now with eight with five of those coming in the UFC. You know, you've beaten guys like Ed Herm and Francis Carmont, now Tim Bosch. I know that most middleweights are already booked in fights, but if you could fight anybody, you know, who would you want next? Uh, to be honest... I'm in top. I'm in uh, number ten now, and in front of me, there's a lot of good guys. Mm. I was watching the the guys, uh, in top uh, ten or fifteen excellent guys. My division is very complicated, and in in this situation right now, I want to relax, breathe a little bit, see some fights that will be happening. And wait for the UFC call me again, but I don't know. Some people they are saying it, they are talking about me and Team Kennedy, me and uh, and uh, the English guy uh, Michael Bisping. Michael Bisping, but I don't know. I don't know what will be. I you know it's up to the UFC. Uh, I just want to be fighting with the best guys in the world, and I'm new to UFC, and there is a lot of the you know, the best guys in the world are there. And uh, in front of me, in a you know that's just tough fighters. You know, all the respect for all, for all, but I want to fight with the best fighters in the world, of course. You know, um, and I'm, I'm doing it. And just now it's time to wait, relax, and see what it will be. Absolutely. Now, we're going to put another name in the hat here, Taylor, because you know how excited we are about watching you fight. This one is a man by the name of Gegard Masasi. Now, he had a, a big, he had a big, big he, win. He's a guy in your yeah. division. I mean, that's, good. That's, a, that's a firecracker fight. That's a fight that me and everybody around the world would love to see. Is he a guy that you might be interested in fighting next if the opportunity presents itself? Yeah, if the UFC put me to fight with him, why not? I will be ready, man. He is tough. You know, I respect him a lot. I like to watch his fights. He fights four every time. He has rock hands, too. And he's very confident. I like his fight style, you know. But why not? It's like I told you, in front of me in the UFC ranking, there's a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. I think number nine is Bisping, number eight it's uh, Musasi, number seven, Tim Kennedy. You know, number six, it's Romero, Joel Romero, mm. you know. It's pretty, pretty dangerous, guys, you know. And it will be a war, for sure. I will, I will do my best always and looking for the, the victory every time. Sounds like you've definitely done your research. You pretty much know the top 10 off by heart. Uh, tell us, you had five months between your last two fights. You know, how are you feeling physically? You know, do you, do you have any injuries? And how soon do you think it'll be before we see you back in the octagon again? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling great. I was feeling great. This is, this is why I accepted the fight when Joe Silva told me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the best shape of my life, in the best uh, moment of my life. I'm feeling, like I told you, for everyone before, I'm feeling great. I'm in the best moment, and uh, I'm feeling more stronger and physically, mentally, and you know, special mentally. It, it made a lot of difference to me. The BJJ mental coach. We have been working for a for a for a time, and he changed my life. I'm being I've been more confident. It makes me more aggressive. Looking for the makes me look for the the finish the fight. You know, don't let the judges end. You know. I will mm. try this, uh, of course, a- every time. But you know, it's not always that we 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 will get it. You know, yeah, a lot of a lot of trouble and a lot of good guys in this division. But in my last three fights, I did it, and I hope still doing it. Well, absolutely, Talos. And you know, when a guy looks as great as you, you got to go back into the training. You know, we've seen you really put everything together in your last few fights. And you've been fighting for a really, really long time. You know, in your opinion, how much more do your skills have left to advance? And, or do you feel like some of the skills have peaked? In, in training, when you're doing your striking and you're doing all your other aspects, do you still see yourself improving a whole lot more as you go through the fight game? Yeah, sure, sure. I've been doing my, my I'm improving my stand-up game for a long time. But the key, 
is that now I've been training more professional and uh, more confident. It it changed. It makes me more confident a lot. You know, of course that I'm, I've been training my improving my stand up game, but I never forget my 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 raise it and my my jiu jitsu. You know, of course I I love training jiu jitsu. It makes me you know makes me healthy, makes me stronger, you know. I, I love to do it, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I will be like uh, 10, 15 days off, and then I'm back to train jiu-jitsu slowly, just to, you know, for fun with my friends, and then I come back to the gym to help my friends who, who has fighting coming up, and, you know, it's and going, getting better every time, of course. We're definitely going to talk to you about uh, your friends, uh, specifically Jose Aldo. We'll chat to, to you a little bit later about that. One thing that we want to talk to you about, Talis, is, you know, last time when you were on the show, we spoke to you about Anderson Silva and, uh, you know, if you'd like a rematch with him and things like that. You know, he came back, you know, last weekend. He fought Nick Diaz. You know, what did you think about the fight? What did, Do you think that he looked like his old self? What were your thoughts? Uh... Everybody was expecting more more that fight than you know than they did. But there he, he's a really tough fighter. He was coming back from a serious injury, and we don't know what was in his mind inside the cage. What what was the feelings? You know, a lot of emotions. If uh, he really was confident about his leg and about his his game plan, and other thing, uh, Nick Diaz is a real tough guy. He fight forward. He was doing some jokes during the during the the, the fight, but yeah. it, you know it's con, it's uh, it's confused the opponents like Anderson did before during all his career. He he's, he saw uh, Nick Diaz doing the same as he as you know not too much. Of course, not too much like under, uh, Nick Diaz did much more than Anderson used to do. But you know it's confused. You know mm. and. In my opinion, he did. He, the, the, the fight was good, but most of the people was expecting more. And you know, I think the next next time maybe you know he will be more confident, more aggressive. You know, but the fight, in my opinion, was good. They did they they work. Well, the other big news was, of course, that Anderson tested positive for two types of steroid metab- metabolites. Metabolites. I can't speak English very well. Uh, most people <laughs> yeah. in the MMA world were shocked. You know, a lot of people were shocked. Casper, we did an interview um, on this show, and Casper mentioned that it was like MMA fans finding out Santa Claus wasn't real. You know, what was your reaction when you heard the news? Were you shocked as well? I was shocked for sure, but I I don't think it is real because Anderson is a great athlete, and I don't believe that. Uh, I think he will prove. You know. That the, the the I think that he will prove that the the commission was did something wrong. I don't know. You know, I hope so. You know, but he's he's professional. He's been doing this for a long time. He did 19 fights in UFC and never happened. Why just now? You know what I mean? So it's up to the athletic commission and with Anderson. But I wish all the best for him and I hope it's all you know that it's a misunderstood i hope so i think to a lot of people it's like a bad dream and they hope that something will happen where it's proven that no it was in fact an incorrect test and we can all stop worrying about that you know but if i I know it's very tough to uh to you know overturn a commission's decision we've seen it many times in the past you know and obviously he's been considered the greatest in the sport for a long time if he if he can't change the the test do you think that ruins his legacy uh, a little bit, you know what I mean. But what he did, it's he did already. He did a lot of things, a good things to the to the to the MMA. The MMA is big, you know. It's it's this size is 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 how big that today. And um, most of the you know a lot of because his fight, he did a you know he did a great he he did great shows. He beat really tough fighters, and he was the champion for a long time. It is hard to be champion for a long time. And you know, I, I don't I don't believe that he will that that situation will you know uh, we will make make his image you know dirty to the to the world. You know what I mean? If I say that the the good English. Now, tell us, we let the fans know that you were coming on the show, and because you were the hottest fighter coming out of UFC 183, we so got hot. a whole bunch of 
questions coming in. We could only choose a few, so we're going to ask you a few fan questions right now. The first one comes from sure. Jam Factory 66. Um, Jam Factory 66 would like to know, with your recent career resurgence, how do you see yourself matching up to the current middleweight champion, Chris Weidman, and what are some of the advantages you'd have over him if you guys did fight? Uh, Chris Weidman is a, is a real tough fighter. He's a champion, and he deserves to be the champion. But, of course, if I had the chance to fight with him, and I would like one day to test myself, I would do, you know, I will fight him forward for sure. I will exchange him punches, kick his knees and everything. You know, we will do a war for sure, you know. But my jiu-jitsu will be, I think that will be a, a, a difference in this, this matchup. But he is a real tough in jiu-jitsu too. I saw his fights and his wrestling is awesome, outstanding. But, you know, fight is fight. You know, every fight starts 50-50. And then during the fight, it can change. You know, and of course, I will, I will have to train a lot, improve myself every time, and fight forward for him. You don't, you you cannot, you cannot let him like the fight and, and fight forward. You have to fight forward and and make him move back. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, Disco Dealer has a question. We said we were going to chat to you about your teammates. His question is: uh, One of your teammates, Jose Aldo, will be fighting Conor McGregor. Are you confident Jose will be able to defeat Conor? And do you think it'll be a dominant finish? Yeah, sure. Uh, will be a great fight. McGregor is a uh, tough. He's tough. He deserves the title shot. And all this trash talk that he's doing, it is good to the show, to to the world, to the UFC mainly. But Aldo will kick his ass definitely. I I, <laughs> I, I said it sometimes to the interviews. And just get ready and uh, get uh, to McGregor. Get ready because Aldo will kick your legs so strong that he won't walk for a week. Definitely. It will be a great match. He fight forward and Aldo too. And Aldo is angry, man. Aldo is angry and he is focused on all ever his fight. But this fight will be different. He will he will go like a beast to you know to destroy mm-hmm. McGregor. Just to cut in there, Dennis, sir, I'm curious as someone who trains with you know Joe's Aldo, he always seems like a very calm, relaxed, kind of focused guy. Yeah, he is. Have you seen anything different in Joe's Aldo? Is he is he throwing darts at like a dartboard with Connor's face on it or anything <laughs> like that? Is he like Oh uh, no. He he's re- he's normal like like all the all, all the fights, but in his mind, when he puts something in his mind, he won't change, you know? It makes a lot of uh, confidence. He is very, very confident, relaxed, calm. He goes to the fight like, like uh, I'm going to the to buy a, a piece of bread. You know, I'm going to buy a juice at the corner, in, and he goes to the fight. He goes into the fight, but in his mind, he's very confident. He's very aggressive, and all well, this time won't be different. And all this trash talk make him more. You know. Uh, makes him be more aggressive and with uh, much more wishes. You know what I mean. Mm. And it's uh, uh, every every everybody at the at the, at the Novo Union team, you know, is supporting him to this fight and will be supporting much more. You know, will be a, a lot of pressure in a, in a McGregor for sure. But you know, Aldo Aldo is a beast. Aldo is a beast. He will kick that, uh, his ass for sure. Now, final uh, fan question here, Talos, comes from Wide Belt for Life. He'd like to, and we touched on this previously, but he'd like to know, as someone who's fought Anderson Silva previously during his superhuman run, his superhuman peak, do you Mm -hmm. think with the recent steroid results, it makes you wonder if Anderson Silva was using something when you fought him previously? Uh, it's hard to say, but you know, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. He, 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 he was the champion who was in the best, in the best moment of his life. I, I, I don't believe it. You know, I don't believe it. We will never know for sure. You know, to be honest, we will never know and it won't change. You know, I don't think about these things. He, in my opinion, he, he, he didn't eat before, you know, and you know, just, just let's wait to see what, what will be, you know, what, uh, what will be the true, the athletic commission on him, but, you know, we have to just wait. But in that situation, I don't believe that he did it. I agree with that theory of, you know, wait and see, wait, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, now, tell us, we've got to wrap up the interview with something we call the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. A whole bunch of fun questions, and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yeah, let's go. All right, tell us, what's your favorite country to fight at and why? 
Brazil, because the the, the 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 public and you know it's my country. There's no jet lags. The the weather, I'm you know it's perfect to me. You know, and it's my house. I'm sorry, tell us the correct answer was Australia. And you never fought here, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, I never been there before. It's a gorgeous place. I would like to be one day. Why not? Sure. Now, tell us, does training Brazilian jiu-jitsu in a gi work for preparing for MMA fights? Hmm. A lot, a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm training every time. Like I said, I love training with the gi, and it makes a lot of difference because you, uh, when you train with gi, you'll be much more, you know, technical. Now, Talis, you've got a daughter. What's the worst kids movie that you had to rewatch a million times with your daughter? Uh, I, of course, I, I love her. You know what I mean. And it changed uh, when, as soon as she's born, she changed my life for better. I'm, I, I, I become a uh much uh way better you know guy to, to the world I, I i start to see the world from other eyes much more you know uh try and help people you know be more simple and see the the real value of the life but in in terms of movies like i know kids obviously want to watch kids movies and you know adults want to watch different movies what what's what's the worst movie that she watches all the time that you you can't stand like is there any uh, point where where you're like hey uh, let, let's watch fury and she's like no we're going to watch frozen instead oh yeah yeah frozen peppa piggy yeah, and uh, right. uh i i love uh, the the brave you know that the princess brave is uh, i don't know the in brazil in portuguese they call valente it's one prince, but this different prince. She like uh, um, Archer, you know, and she is she's not that kind of princess. So you know, mm. so uh, I, I want to be beautiful. I want to be do like that. <laughs> she is she is a kind of warrior. She 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 hide a back horse. She goes to the waterfall. You know, she like different things. The different difference. Uh, she's a different princess. I love that movie. Mm. But of course, Frozen. She was freaking me out with Frozen. <laughs> she was. <laughs> she, she wanted. Uh, uh, when when I bought the movie for her, you know, uh, six months ago probably, I bought the movie. And every day when she comes to the school, she said, "I want to watch." Frozen. I want to watch Frozen. I want to see Frozen. I want to see Frozen. Uh, she did it for 15 days consecutive. One day I say, no, no, let's change it. Let's see something different. It's better because, you know, the song it was in my mind. I was sleeping here, the Frozen song. <laughs> oh, that's did, did, did watching Frozen so much help you let it go against him, Baj? Let it go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, tell us back to the tap out round. A title shot, a title shot in the middleweight division in 2015. Is that a part of your New Year's resolutions? Well, one of them. Why not? You know, I have a lot of things to prove. I'm five and zero in UFC since my return. But like I told you, there's a lot of beasts in front of me in the, in the division, and uh, a lot of you know, there's some of the guys in front of me that real really deserve the, the 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 title shot and maybe one more fight will be there you know and i, I don't know two more one or two more fights you know depends on the ufc and you know maybe i get the title shot chance but you know i don't know i don't think about it now you know i just want to go step by step making my job and you know and, and showing my, my my skills inside the cage you know what i mean it's it's all I want. I want to be fighting for the best guys in the world, you know, and improving myself every time and fight forward, fight excited and be confident every time. Tell us, we've seen your skills inside the cage. Uh, what about Talos Leites versus Jose Aldo in a soccer shootout? Who wins? In a soccer? Yeah. He will beat me. He will beat me. I'm horrible <laughs> in a soccer. I, I just... I just played for fun for my friend, but he, he he looks he looks good in soccer. I never played with him, but I, I will I will challenge him one day to to see. Become the ultimate soccer champion. It's got to be a part <laughs> of your resolutions, man. Now, um, for fans listening at home who might not know, give us a standard training day uh, during a training camp for Talos Laters. What does your schedule look like? Um, depends. We depends the day of the week, but uh, three days of the week I do uh, workout conditioning mm -hmm. and uh, jiu-jitsu, you know, and boxing. And the other days I do MMA sparring, Muay Thai, and wrestling. Very nice. And then the weekend is of course frozen. Uh, who is? <laughs> 
Who's the hardest hitting opponent you've ever faced in your MMA career? Uh, the hardest opponent. Uh, every time is the last. You know what I mean. I I I, I had some. You know. You know some hard fights that I. I you know I my face were hurt a lot. Uh, like with uh, Nate Marquardt, but I fought to the end. When uh, when I fought Martin Kempton was good too. Anderson Silva, you know. But you know, in my mind, the last fight was it's always the the most uh, the most difficult. You know what I mean? Mm. But to to put in my mind, if I have to pick one, you know, the the most I think was the. I think was the Nate Marquardt because in UFC 85 because all the situation the illegal knee and you know yeah. I was knocked out you know and and I went, and I still fighting. Now, Taz, we're going to finish up the interview with something very interesting. Now, um, we've had the Submission Radio Marketing Department stay in the office over the weekend away from their families and children to come up with three new nicknames for you to potentially use in the future. Now, you have, you know, we, we don't think you need to use it, but you need to choose what your favorite yeah. nickname is, okay? So we've got three options here. The first one is Tala's Triangle of Death latest because you win <laughs> with the arm triangle every time. It the is next good. One, it is good. The next one is simple, okay? I just want you to let this one marinate in your mind for a second. The tap dancer. Because you the can what? Tap the any- tap dancer? Yeah. The tap dancer because you can tap anyone and then you can do a victory dance. Now, tell us, you've got to know, this one comes <laughs> included with tap dance shoes to be worn for the entrance because it's going to okay. be authentic. Or the final okay. one, okay? And I want you to hold your judgment here because I know there's been a couple of instant classics. The final one, <laughs> the Cincinnati Smog Strangler. Now, we know it has nothing to do with you, but it sounds awesome. What's Cincinnati? Cincinnati Cincinnati is a quiet place in America, but we know it sounds awesome, and it would look sweet on a T-shirt. So which one do you Uh, choose? uh, Should I have to pick one? I think the second, it's it's good, and the, the first one. But, you know, I, I, when they, 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 they give them the papers to, to, to fill, they ask it a nickname and I put ugly Shrek and something like that. They never <laughs> called me. I don't know. Really? You know, my nickname in Brazil for my friend, they, I, I call my friends, hey, hey, ugly, hey, ugly, what's <laughs> up? And, and a lot of, you know, all my friends call me, hey, ugly, good, ugly. If you see in my, in my, in my uh, Instagram, all my friends say, boa feio, it's, it's good, ugly, you know? Oh, and, yeah. uh, after the fights, all the comments is like this, but, you know, I don't mind. Of course, I want to, it could, I, I should have a nickname, but I don't know, n- nobody never calls me by a nickname, but, you know, it is a, it's a good option. I like it. Yeah, great. Cincinnati Smoke Strangler. Just tell Bruce Buffer next time. I'm, I'm just <laughs> so so when you when you sign up for fights, you actually write that your nickname is Ugly and Shrek and things like that, so that Bruce Buffer announces it. Yeah, I put it uh, the Rusik and uh, Braveheart. I put a lot of <laughs> things, but they never called me. You know, I because the last fight the uh, the Team Boat's uh, nickname is the, the Barbarian. And I put my nickname, uh, the Rusk, you know, to be the barbarian against the Rusk, but they didn't. <laughs> wow, Bruce Buffer not doing his job. I'm really disappointed in that, guys. <laughs> yeah, the Rusk, the, the Brazilian Rusk. I put, I, I if I if I remember, I I, I put the Brazilian Rusk. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, guys, you can check out all these awesome comments, and of course, Talis Latis is uh, keep up with Talis Latis is live on Twitter at Talis Latis. Don't forget to check that out, Talis. We're very excited to see who you fight next, and once again. Congratulations on your win at UFC 183. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, guys. I appreciate, I appreciate all your support, your Australian fans. I would like to be in Australia one day. I would like to meet your country. I saw a lot of pictures, and I have some friends living there. And, you know, it's an amazing country. Congratulations, and I hope to see you one day, guys. Thank you. And there you have it, guys. The hottest fighter coming out of UFC 183, as said by Bleacher Report. You know, Cass, every time we speak about Talos, I feel like we're talking about how much he's improved, how excited we are to see him in that octagon. I mean, you know, a lot of fighters deserve praise, but it, I just feel like it's a second coming, completely different fighter. And this win streak that he's riding is really impressive. I'm just really excited to see him in that octagon and see who he gets next. You know, what do you think about it all? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I always think about that fight he had against Anderson Silva just because he was the biggest high-profile fight he's ever had. And when you look at that fight compared to where he's at now, you know, really is night and day. And I'm really happy for the guy given his success, given how he's turned his career around. You know, he got booted out of the UFC and now he's he's on an eight-fight win streak, five in a row in the UFC. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see who he gets next. It's going to be a top 10 guy. There's a lot of guys in middleweight, a lot of exciting fights for him. I would love to see Taz Ladies versus Bisping. You know, if Tim Kennedy decides to come back from, uh, from not really retirement, but, you know, he's taking that break from MMA. If he decides to come back, I'd love to see Talis Ladies versus Tim Kennedy. A lot of exciting fights. And uh, it's just good because it's such a loaded division. There's already so many killers at the top. I'd love to have Talis Ladies added to that list. He's got such an awesome skill set, you know, deadly jiu-jitsu, and his hands are really coming along. So, you know, I mentioned that. Anderson Silva fight just a second ago, and that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today. That is our biggest topic. Anderson Silva, of course, he failed his uh, pre-fight drug test, tested positive for two type of steroid metabolites, and it's pretty much all gone downhill in the last few days in the world of MMA. Dennis, I want to get your thoughts. You know, in terms of the reactions, uh, what was your first reaction upon hearing the news? You know, Casper, you compared it to MMA. Uh, you compared MMA fans to kids fighting out that Santa Claus isn't real. I believe that's probably one of the best ways to portray it. No way any MMA fans out there would have thought that Anderson Silva was going to test positive for anything. I mean, it's it's one of those situations where you sit around in a gym and a couple of guys might say, oh, yeah, that guy from Pride or that guy from the UFC, you know, he looked so juiced up. He looked so, you know, he looked so pumped up. He was definitely on something. You know, not once have I ever heard anybody go, Anderson Silva, he's taking something bad. You know, he's he's cutting corners. I mean, Anderson Silva, for people, I mean, John Jones, you know, a lot of people see that guy as pound for pound the greatest fighter. But Anderson Silva, he comes from that generation where it was really more about the martial arts. And a lot of people see, you know, a lot of, a lot of the respect, a lot of the tradition in Anderson Silva. So when they found out, just like myself, about this, I think they were just absolutely shocked. And I was absolutely shocked. I was, I was just damn f- dumbfounded. And now, Casper, you know, quite recently, uh, John Jones, he tested positive for cocaine. You know, w- w- give me the difference between your reactions of finding out John Jones testing positive for cocaine, who's John Jones, one of the greatest pound for pound guys, or and Anderson Silva testing positive for steroids. You know, give me, give me sort of what was the big difference for you in the reactions to both of those? Well, I mean, I think the answer is sort of in the question right there, at least for me. Like, on one hand, you've got cocaine, which is a recreational drug, which I don't really see how that's going to help you fight and how it's going to help you perform, especially if you're doing cocaine one month before, the before you know, you fight and you, you're versing an amazing fighter like Daniel Cormier, former Olympian and stuff like that. I just don't see how cocaine would help. You know, it's a, th- it's a thing that yeah. you can look down on, but I don't think it's going to help. But then when you look at Anderson Silva and this guy, you know, tested positive for two steroids, well, steroids obviously do help. I was reading up a little bit about him. Certainly not uh, an expert on steroids, but... You know, all, all, all these the, these steroids that he was taking, it's not like they were just weight cutters. There was They weren't just diuretics. These were steroids that basically help build muscle and, you know, definitely enhance performance. So there's a huge difference there. And I think one of the, the key things about Anderson Silva and why it was such a shock, I think, like you said, Dennis, he was always looked at as a pure martial artist. He looked, at, he looked like a guy who was just old school and just ridiculously talented, and he is. And I think it's also to do with the fact that uh, his stature, you know, he's not really a very big guy. Like, I think he's six foot two, pretty yep. skinny, and he's beating up all these guys that are, uh, you know, a lot bigger than him or potentially stronger than him. And I think it was really inspirational for a lot of people. Like, you know, you like... I look at a guy like, for example, Tyron Woodley, you know, and I'm I'm not trying to drag Tyron Woodley's name into this whole steroid thing, you know, he's, he's not on steroids or anything like that. I'm just saying, I look at him, I look at his physique, and I know I'm never going to look like that. So a lot of people may look at a guy like, say, Tyron Woodley or Brock Lesnar or, you know, whatever, it's just some of these, like, imp- impeccable physiques and think, like, that's an elite athlete. Unless I dedicate every day, every second of my life, I, I, won't, I won't look like that, I may not perform like that. And then you look at a guy like Anderson Silva, and you, know, you look at young folks, of him he was so skinny you would never picture that this guy would be the best fighter in the world and uh, you know he did become that so i think it was very very inspirational you know he didn't didn't look jacked or juiced up or anything like that so to find out that he's taking or allegedly been taking two steroids uh it was extremely extremely disappointing and i think it's different compared to a lot of other fighters 
when you see you see the tweets you see the internet and everyone's like yeah hey, you know we go figure and we, we knew it all along we had our suspicions no one no one expected this with anderson silver and even most fighters I think it's like 50-50, half of them are angry and half of them are just sad and just disappointed. You know, a lot of fighters are saying how it's, it's disappointing how you can't have idols anymore. Yeah, that's right. You know, and I absolutely agree with you there. You know, if for so many years, for so many years, the UFC has, have been talking about Anderson Silva, the greatest ever. You know, someone new to the sport, like a fan, might go, what should I watch? I've never watched any MMA. And the first thing people would say, go watch Anderson Silva. Yeah. They'll go, who? is the greatest of all time. The first thing people would say is Anderson Silva. Who should, you know, my kids look up to in MMA. They would say Anderson Silva. You know, who should I, you know, it's just, it just the list goes on. And for so many years, you know, I don't want to say, I, I, Anderson Silva is very much like Michael Jordan to me with basketball. When I look at basketball, I think Michael Jordan. And when I think Michael Jordan, I think basketball. It's almost like he represents the sport to me. And if I found out that Michael Jordan uh, did something like this, I mean, I'd just be devastated. Mm. Much like Muhammad Ali is to boxing. A lot of people have different uh, boxing idols. But for a large generation, Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time, you know, if I found out Muhammad Ali was cutting corners, I'd be devastated. So for a lot of people in this MMA generation, they think Anderson Silva, then they think MMA. They think MMA, then they think Anderson Silva. I mean, he's become so associated with it. And I think all these, like you mentioned, all these other fighters testing positive for drugs, like Charles Sonnen, or this whole situation with Vandalay Silva, they go, I can accept that. That's okay. But I think a lot of people, when they heard Anderson Silva, I think that really hit him hard. I, I mean... It, 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 I think it might cause them to think about what's going on with the sport. And I know we'll cover that a little bit later. But, Casper, I just want to ask you this. You know, Kung Lee, he tested positive for steroids. And, you know, he defended himself. He said, I'm not guilty. You know, the, st the tests were wrong. I believe the tests were wrong. You know, I, I never really found out what exactly ended up happening with that. But he did end up on the other side of that lawsuit. He felt wronged by the UFC. Like, the UFC didn't support him. It really seemed like he actually believed he was innocent. Now, Anderson Silva um, said, I have not taken any performance-enhancing drugs. That's what he's saying. So is there a chance in your mind that there was some sort of mistake and Anderson Silva might be clean? And just to clarify, with Kung Lee, he didn't test positive for steroids. His testosterone levels were higher than they should have been. So they weren't, they weren't actually steroids found. So your question is, will do you think this, this whole test will be overturned? Is that correct? Yeah. Well, do you think there could have, could have there been a mistake by the lab? Could there, could there be the wrong, wrong test results? Look, I'm an open-minded guy, and uh, I, I don't like when people give definite answers and say, this is the way it is, it's either black or white, and there's no other possibilities. So to answer your question, yeah, absolutely, I think there, there could have been a mistake. I mean, we're dealing with science, and science isn't perfect. Um, you, there's so many shows... Uh, you know, like Discovery Channel or whatever, where they have those like, uh, you know, 21 amazing things that no one expected to happen. And you hear comments, you know, <laughs> doctors are baffled. Doctors can't explain it. You know, he should have yep. been dead or things like that. So, you know, I, yeah, there is there is that small there, there is that small chance. I just don't think that it's going to go there. You know, we, we heard comments. I think it was uh, yesterday uh, from Bob Bennett from the NSAC. And uh, I'm just trying to find the comments to see if I can uh, find them. Bob Bennett uh, said, yes, it will be ruled a no contest. I don't know if he will receive the win bonus after his change. That's the UFC's call, but a percentage of his purse will be held because of this episode. So it looks like the win's going to be a no contest. The NSAC are going to vote. And, uh, you know, obviously Anderson Silva's got his hearing, so that's not too far away. It's about a couple of weeks away. I don't think this test is going to get overturned. Anderson Silva... Because uh, there's obviously that B sample, and uh, you can have that B sample examined, which is obviously what Anderson Silva has, uh, you know, opted to do. But he wanted to t get that sample taken to another laboratory and uh, have it looked under, have it looked at somewhere else. Now the NSAC denied that because it doesn't go against the WADA's uh, regulations, so he can't he can't take it anywhere else. It's going to get examined at the same lab, and honestly, I think it's going to come back with the same results. So to be honest, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm urging everybody to just withhold judgment a little bit because, you know, it hasn't been finalized. Give it give it a couple of weeks, give it time till everything's finalized, et cetera, et cetera. For all we know, it may get changed, and I, I would certainly hope so. I don't think that's going to happen. 
Yeah, you know, exactly. Everyone needs to keep an open mind with this. Now, Black House, where Anderson Silva comes from, you know, the fight camp, um, they've had a number of guys testing positive for PEDs quite recently. Um, I don't have the list of the guys there. Do you have a list of the guys, Cass? I believe Fajal tested positive. I don't I don't at the moment, but I'll bring it up as you speak. Yeah, there, there were a few guys there. So there has to there has to be some sort of investigation. Look at what's going on at the gym. Um, it's it's all very recent in my in my opinion. You know, a lot of these fighters and trainers, you know, they have their their coaches, they have their strength and conditioning guys. You know, maybe there's something, maybe something's going on there. We don't exactly know, but a guy like Anderson Silva breaks his leg, horrific injury, 38 years old. A lot of people say he can't make it back in the sport. He he's trying to get back in there and. Obviously, the steroids, they help a guy like Anderson get back from such a major, major injury. My question to you, Casper, is, you know, if Anderson Silva comes out there and says, look, I did take the steroids. I had this major injury. My body wasn't going to heal in time. I needed it so I could kick and do this and that again. I shouldn't have done it. Um, I wouldn't do it again. I've never done it before. Is this something the fans can forgive him for? Is this something that can be forgotten? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that would make a world of difference. And again, you know, it's still at that stages where we don't quite know what happened. But if Anderson Silva did come out and and say that and say, look, it was was for my leg, you know, the horrific injury, I needed to heal, I needed to put my health first. I would absolutely think that would make a world of difference because automatically you would have people... And it's like Chael Sun has said, if you're honest, if you come out and you're upfront about it, people are a lot more likely to forgive you. And I think at least some people, it would change their mind that Anderson Silva has been juicing his whole career and things like that. And if he came out and he said, look, it was, it was for my leg, I think a lot of people would be understanding and say, all right, he probably wasn't doing it his whole career. It was probably just a case of him doing it for his leg. And, uh, you know, it, it would still be wrong. It wouldn't really be excusable, but I think, for a public image, it would definitely help him look better. Now, Anderson Silva's claiming that he didn't take those things, so I don't, I don't foresee him coming out and saying that. And I, th- I think that's one of the big key things. And sorry, j- just to follow up on that, just to be very clear, I'm not trying to say that if Anderson was to come out and say, "Hey, it was for my leg," that everything would be cool again, that everything would be peaches and cream and hunky dory, and Anderson's back to being the greatest of all time. No, it would still be wrong if he did take those steroids. If he actually took them. It would be absolutely wrong. Even if he did it for his leg, even if he did it to come back quicker, if he wants to heal his leg because it's a horrific injury and then he wants to stay on the sidelines for, I don't know, like two years or or indefinitely, then, okay, I understand. Take steroids. That's fine. You're not going to compete again. But if, if it's a case of, hey, uh, I want to come back quicker and my leg's not quite there yet, uh, but I have a deadline because I need to fight on a certain day. I need to fight Nick Diaz at UFC 183. I'm going to take some steroids to get there quicker. No, that's absolutely wrong. And from what I know about these steroids, and this is my very brief understanding, it takes about three months for these to get out of your system. Now, this this test was in January. Go back through January 9th. Go back three months. That's October 9th. So he would allegedly, if he did take them, he'd be taking them around about October. This fight was announced in July. So if he's had all this time to sort of prepare and things like that, I mean... If he did take him, and if he did take him around October, then yeah, that's disgraceful, and it shouldn't have happened. What I'm just trying to say is if he was to come out and say, look guys, I did it for my leg, I I fucked up, my mistake, this is a ridi- this is really bad, this is ridiculous, um, but I hope you can understand, you know, it, it was for my leg. It wouldn't excuse anything, but at least it would sort of lead people to believe, okay, Maybe he wasn't juicing his whole career. Maybe it was just this one fight. Whereas now, now everyone, everybody's questioning everything. Everybody's going, this guy was probably juicing his whole career, his whole legacy, all that destruction and, you know, those amazing athletic and, and mixed martial arts feats, all of that was due to, uh, due to taking steroids. Yeah, absolutely. And you touched on it briefly. So I guess it's one of the things I really do want to talk about. Does it tarnish his legacy? Now, a couple of fighters... Um, have voiced their opinions. Michael Bisping said, Anderson Silva's legacy is ruined. Who's to say he hasn't been doing this his entire career? However, as you mentioned, Chael Sonnen said, you know, if he did this, I would encourage him and anybody else much like me just to come out and say he did it. The door is still open to come out and just tell us what happened. Say, listen, it was still in my system. I'm busted. I'm sorry. Lay it out. Fate to black. 
and roll the credits. So the big question is, does it hurt his legacy? Now, you know, I have to be honest when I talk about this, Cass, you know, for the listeners and everybody listening back home, when I heard that Anderson tested positive for this stuff, you know, the first thing I thought about was because he looked so amazing throughout his career. I mean, he just looked superhuman. The first thing that came to my mind was, has this been going out, going on throughout his career? Now, I'm a big, big fan of Anderson Silva. You know, I want to give him. I don't. I don't want to say he's been doing this for his whole career, but it does has raised in my mind the question if he has been doing this his whole career. Now. Um, it's just something I can't help but think about. I don't know if you're the same as me, Cass. Did, did this kind of question arise in your mind when you heard about his test failing? To be honest, no. The first thing that I thought of was a man who was desperate, and I thought if this is the case, if this is the case that he really did take them, it's probably due to his leg. And uh, that, that was my mindset. I didn't really think that he's been taking it his whole career. I'm a very firm believer in innocent until proven guilty. You know, and the, the internet's gone crazy with a lot of... A lot of uh, speculation. People are saying, "Well, now Fedor was probably on the juice, and now this guy and that guy and everybody." And I get it. It's it's one of those things, and it's really unfortunate and very disheartening when you know one of your favorite fighters does get popped for a steroid test. But I think we need to sort of still be rational. And yeah, you know, there there may very well be a lot of other guys that haven't been caught. But you, you can't jump to conclusions. You can't say things like, well, obviously Fedor was, was, you know, was on the stuff as well because he was in pride and things like that. You got to really look at it as a case-by-case basis. Now, as far as Anderson Silva's legacy goes, it's a funny thing, and I was thinking about this the other day. I will still look at Anderson Silva, you know, and look at all the amazing things that he did. And, you know, let's be honest, the guy has a tremendous, 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 tremendous amount of skill, you know, steroids or no steroids. There are other guys that could have taken all the steroids in the world and still wouldn't have had the skill that he's had. But one thing that I thought about is a legacy is only as good as, well, it's it's basically based on people's opinions. A legacy isn't something physical. It's not something that you can hold. It's not really something that can even be measured. A legacy is more like if enough people think you're great, well, then I guess you're great. But if most people think you're not great, then you're not great. It's really that simple. So I think uh, it, de- it absolutely tarnishes his legacy because there are people where even if the test gets overturned, there's a lot of people that are either, you know, ignorant or just not willing to really, or, or just love drama. There are people that this, this, you know, this can get contested and overturned and everything. There are people that will still call Anderson Silver a cheat. They will still think that he, you know, took uh, steroids his whole career. And let's let's not forget, you know, we're hardcore MMA fans. Some people are not. There are people in the public, uh, just random everyday people who read, oh, you know, Brazilian fighter test positive for steroids. His name was Anderson Silva, whatever. They will never read the follow-up story and they won't necessarily care. They may not even be into MMA. And, you know, you may say his name years down the track, oh, Anderson Silva. And hypothetically, if the test did get overturned, they would still say, oh, isn't that that guy that, t- you know, test, you know, tested mm. positive for steroids? Mm. So I absolutely think it does... It does tarnish his legacy, and yeah, then you're going to have the people that no matter what will say, no, he was on it the whole time. He was on it his whole career. All these things that he did, you know, regardless of, of and all the talent and whatever, all due to steroids. So, yeah, I absolutely do think it was. It will tarnish his career. Yeah, you know, it's, it's absolutely amazing. The guy has dedicated his life to the sport and has done so many amazing things, and you're spot on. You know, this one thing comes out, and, you know, it must be so difficult for him and his family. Now, Cass... So many guys have been testing positive for um, for PEDs. Uh, we usually turn the blind eye. You know, we'll say, look, it's this situation, it's that situation. You know, the sport's pretty, you know, the sport's doing pretty well. When you hear Anderson Silva test positive for PED, is, does that top it off for you? Does it make you start thinking maybe the sport has a drug problem? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think uh, I think the sport definitely does have a drug problem. That's my honest opinion. Uh, when you've got two guys in one of the biggest main events, uh, I won't say of all time, but in one of the biggest main events in a very, very long time, it's up there with you know Jones Cormier and one of those fights that everyone's excited about. It was a big pay per view, and two guys in the main event both test positive. You got Anderson Silva for steroids, Nick Diaz for marijuana. The previous month, you had. 182 John Jones testing for positive for cocaine. Yeah, I definitely think the sport does have a problem. Uh, I was reading an article, and I do apologize. I, I can't remember who, who wrote this article, but it was basically about a lot of guys, they take steroids because of desperation, because of the pressures to succeed, because it's really a sport where you're not really going to make much money unless you're at the very, very top. Uh, you know, you've got guys who are at the top of other 
organizations who aren't really making all that much money. And I think a lot of guys, it's a, it's, it's a means for them. It's the only thing they're good at. It's the only thing they know. You know, they started doing martial arts from a young age, got into MMA, and it's kind of too late for them to become a doctor or, or a lawyer or, you know, even really a teacher or anything like that. So it's one of those things they need to feed the family and they'll go to any lengths. I'm, I'm sort of throwing it out there. I wonder if people would do as many steroids if the pay was better. I'm not trying to say people do it because it's shit pay or anything like that, but I wonder if the sport was, I guess... M- you know, there was more money in the sport and you could be a guy who's not necessarily that successful. Would people still do steroids? Would there be as much? What do you think, Dennis? You know, that's actually a really, really interesting question. You know, I'd have to agree with you that, you know, if, if a guy that was fighting, you know, was getting maybe even the amount of money the boxers get, um, I, I think that it might, might absolutely decrease uh, the amount of people doing it. I mean, the other big issue, I think, is for these MMA fighters is the fact that they realize, hey, I can't do this for very long. I mean, basketball players, soccer players, all these guys, they can come back around their 40s if they're really good. But MMA, the I mean, boxers, people always say, look, this guy uh, came back in boxing. I mean, you, you, you don't have to look far, look far to see all these amazing boxers in their 40s, in their 50s, you know, um, Holyfield and all those other guys, you know. But it, boxing training is completely different. MMA training, you know, Cass, you and me, we, we've trained, you know, just – for fun, um, we've done the samba, we've done the jiu-jitsu, a little bit of boxing here and there. You know, we're, we're, we're guys about 25, 26, and our bodies, you know, if we do a few training sessions a week, our bodies are feeling it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I did a few sessions this week, and my body's, you know, absolutely killing me right now. Um, these guys that uh, are in an MMA that want to have a long career span, they might be finding they just can't keep up with the training you know, in the mid thirties, in in their th- in their early thirties, after doing it for so long, and you know that's a serious problem. I mean, there's no plan B for these guys, but I mean, the big thing um, for me is, you know, how how bad is it, and is it as bad as it once? You know, is it worse now than it was before? Because before you didn't have all these complicated tests, and these guys didn't get tested as much. So back in those in the days, and I mean, I'm not going to point it to any fighters, but you know, Cass, sometimes you and me we watch certain videos. Back in the day in certain organizations, we'll look at guys and we'll say, wow, this guy is absolutely huge. You know, or this guy looks absolutely different from what he looks like now. I mean, back in the, you know, 2000s and late 90s and even around that, that time, you know, the fighters looked completely different. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, one of the things, you know, that I'm really curious about, and I was really interested to speak to Frank Shamrock about it was, you know, is it as bad today as it was before or is it just the same and people are getting caught? I think it's the case of where the testing is a lot more strict nowadays. You know, you've got out of competition testing and things like that. I think it's always been there. And I think now we're just finding out who, who, you know, who is and who, who was on the stuff and things like that. I think it's, look, it's always going to be a race. It's always going to be a case of the tests will be more stricter and updated. And then people will have better masking agents. It's kind of like with, you know, your, your computer and like antivirus software. As soon as they release an update of viruses, you know, the hackers go to work and they make new viruses. And it's always just the, you know, it's like, um, Roadrunner and the, and the coyote. They're always just going to be chasing each other. But the good thing is that there's more and more testing and the testing is stricter, but the only, there's still mistakes that to me are very laughable. Like with this whole pre-fight test, uh, you've got the commission doing the test. They did, it, I think January 9th, it went to, off to the lab. There was no priority put on it, right? The tests go there, they're, they're anonymous. When the labs look at it, they don't, they don't know whose test it is. They don't go, oh, this is Nick Diaz's test or this is Anderson Silva's test. I would assume it's something like, here's test number 6,852. This is either positive or negative. But because there was no priority put on it, and there could have been, it came back so late, the fight had already happened. And what a lot of fighters and fans are you know, now scratching their head with is, why the hell were these mm. guys allowed to fight? Mm. What is the point of having a pre-fight test? Now, mm. one point I see, okay, fighters may be a lot more careful uh, around fight night. And they may go, okay, okay, you know, here's that 12-hour window. I've got to make sure all the stuff is out of my system. I've got to be careful with this. Uh, so if you do a pre-fight test and it's spontaneous, you may pick up on something that they had, you know, a while ago. But still, looking at it, it's like, 
and Bob Bennett has come out and said, I think it was Bob Bennett, one of the guys from the NSAC has said, in the future, we will put priorities on all these tests and make sure that they come back as soon as possible. Because it, it can take a month, but it can be priorities prioritized and come back a lot quicker. And it's just crazy that something like this had to happen for these guys to learn and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, in the future, we'll pr put a priority on it. It's like, is it not logic? Does it not make yeah. absolute sense to just put a priority on it? These guys yeah. are fighting in literally less than a month. Like It's crazy to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just sounds to me like amateur hour over there. And I mean, the big thing is, you know, you take steroids in sprinting or you take steroids in whatever other sport you do. But MMA, you know, you're hitting the other guy. So steroids, you know, they're actually, they can actually hurt the opponent. I mean, if it gives a guy, you know, some kind of a huge advantage that's not natural you could see a guy getting really injured from that so i absolutely agree with you there needs to be a priority put down on this i mean i think a lot of people are just scratch scratching their heads now you know the other guy in the fight of course was nick diaz cass um he's had some issues before with weed marijuana when when at the whole anderson silver thing came out i guess it overshadowed the fact that he tested positive by a lot and i mm. mean again marijuana you know, we we do not condone condone drugs on this show. We don't support it in any way. But I don't see marijuana the same as uh, steroids. You know, I don't see it as a performance enhancing drug. Um, you know, Richard Perez himself, you know, on this show said that it just slows you down. You know, it might have a numbing effect, but that's only if it's in your system. It's it's really counterproductive to a person's career, in my opinion. But he tested positive for it, for it again. You know, he's going to have to appear in front of the commission again because of it. So it looks like um, he's going to be in a bit of trouble over it. Cass, what did you think about Nick testing positive for marijuana again? I was, okay. <laughs> it's really funny because it's completely contrasting to Anderson Silva. With Anderson Silva, it was a huge shock. And oh my God, you know, Santa Claus isn't real and this kind of thing. With, with Nick Diaz, he was just like, oh, okay, yeah. Go figure. Doesn't surprise me at all. It was almost too good to be true. He went up to middleweight. You know, he came and, yeah, he missed the open workouts at fight week. But, you know, he gave all his interviews and he seemed great. Everyone's commenting how, yeah, you know, really proud of Nick Diaz. He, you know, really did well with his media obligations. There was no, like, swearing or flipping off. And, obviously, the fight had some controversy. But, I mean, not, not really anything by Nick Diaz standards. And then, of course, he pops positive for marijuana. So, I, I was still disappointed. I was like, man... I wish he would just, I wish he would, I, I don't even know if get it together is the right word because I guess getting it together would mean that that's what you want to do. I don't, I don't think that Nick Diaz wants to stop, you know, smoking marijuana. I don't, I don't think he cares. I think Nick Diaz, back in the day, we used to watch pro wrestling and, you know, you had a guy called Stone Cold Steve Austin and he was very much the anti-hero. He would go against the establishment and he would basically do what he believes and his character was, you know, a big F you to the boss. And I think Nick Diaz is the real life version of Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, like you say, don't do weed, don't do this, you'll fail your test. And Nick Diaz is like, I don't care, I don't care. You know, don't don't lay down. You're fighting the greatest fighter of all time. You know, quite possibly, I, I don't care. So, I was disappointed with Nick Diaz testing positive for marijuana, just because I know that Nick Diaz says that he may he may have retired, but if he does decide to come back, he's probably not going to be back for a year. And I'm very interested to see what the uh, what the athletic commission does because this is his third test in a row that he's failed, and I'm worried that they, this might end up being like a permanent ban. It's like, all right, three strikes, you're out. What do you think about this, Dennis? What was yeah, your you reaction? Know, well, you know, I'm I'm exactly as you. I'm just devastated for Nick Diaz and the MMA community. The guy comes back, like you mentioned, looked great. Um, in the Anderson Silver fight, sure, he looked a little bit funny here and there. And Richard Perez, that whole thing happened that we spoke about earlier on the show. But, you know, I just, I, I was excited to see him back in MMA. You know, he was a big star. And hashtag time is now, you know, every it's all happening right now. And when I saw the fact that he popped again for weed, it was just me being disappointed. Because I think the commission is going to make an example out of Nick Diaz. And it's going to be a real shame if they give him a ban for, let's say, two years. Because the guys already missed, what was it? Did he miss a year, almost a year after the GSP fight? Did he did he pop after the GSP fight, Cass? I'll be honest, I, I can't remember, but I know that I, he's, he's had two suspensions. I can't yeah. remember if there's 12 one, months or nine months. I think one was like uh, when he fought in Pride. Against then, Gomi, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So the guy has missed a year out of his prime. Now, he's definitely in his prime right now, but sort of in the last part of his prime. 
I mean, if he gets a two-year suspension, that's two years of his career that he's going to miss. That's two years that MMA fans won't be able to see him fight. And who knows what's going to happen in two years. He may very well come back in two years, and the landscape is just going to change so much. And, you know, I'm just going to be honest with everybody who's listening to the show. Just move past him. Mm. He might just they might just move past him. And we may, ne- we may not see uh, Nick Diaz fight in the UFC octagon again. And, you know, that, that's just a huge shame. I always felt like Nick Diaz never reached his potential. I always felt like, you know, he was just only coming into his own his last few fights. And now knowing the fact that he won't fight again. And it's, and it's like, I understand that he, he likes smoking it. And he's spoken before that. It, it helps him. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, they see marijuana as a, as a way to chill out. He, he seems like he's got some issues dealing with certain things. And he uses that to deal with it. But I just find it stupid, man. I'll be honest. I just find it stupid. You know, and that's the thing. Nick Diaz, he dances to the beat of his own drum. You know, we were talking to Richard Perez, who wasn't getting paid by Nick Diaz because, you know, he changed managers and all that's going on. It just seems to me that there's a bit of a, you know, a clusterfuck going on when it comes to his management and the way he's being handled. I mean, if I was his manager or anyone like that, I would say, Nick, you cannot, you cannot test positive for marijuana going into this fight this is your big return you can't do it man this may be your career and you know maybe they said that to him maybe they didn't but the fact that it's popped up the fact that he's going to go in front of that commission for a third time and you man that commission you know they don't mess around i don't know what they're going to do but they may make an example of him and yeah if they do i mean that's a big i feel like that's a big loss to the mma community i feel like that's a big loss to the fans and it's going to be something that Dick Diaz is going to look back on, you know, throughout his life and wonder, you know, what if I just held off a little bit going into the fight? What would have happened then? That's that's personally what I think. And the other thing is, you know, with Nick Diaz, obviously he's been he's been very vocal about the pain, how he's not getting enough and things like that. And he wants big matchups. So it's like he gets this big matchup and he hmm. gets, I think he got paid half a million dollars for this fight, which is... He did, yeah. That's huge. I remember when uh, Randy Couture faced, faced James Tony, and James Tony got half a million dollars, and everyone was like, "Oh my god, like that's so much more money than anyone else has gotten before." That's huge, you know. Now, now the sport obviously having grown, Nick Diaz is able to get a pay like five hundred thousand dollars, Anderson Silva eight hundred thousand dollars, and it sucks because these guys are gonna lose money now. It's not like. It's it's like they can even spend all of it. The commission is gonna is gonna find them. Anderson, it, it comes out of their purse. It's a percentage. Anderson Silver stands to lose, I think, at least two hundred and forty thousand dollars. That is huge. That wow. is almost a quarter of a million dollars. It may not be much compared to what he's earned in his career, but that's still that's still a lot of money. You could buy a house for that kind of money. That's crazy. Nick Diaz, I mean, it could be similar. Maybe I don't know, like. 120 100 and something thousand dollars that's still going to be a lot of money and that's the thing like if nick diaz decides to retire tomorrow he's going to need all the money he can get because i don't see nick diaz necessarily getting into real estate or day trading <laughs> or or acting you know what i mean like yeah I, I, i'd love i'd love to see nick diaz try and sell a house that would be awesome <laughs> that would be hilarious in a, in a red blazer <laughs> like Phil Dunphy and from Modern Family, yes. I'd love to see him and Phil Dunphy work together and like try and sell houses. Yes, it's a, it's a great house, whatever and shit. Um, <laughs> and that, and that's the thing, you know. Like I, as as a person, like I, I like Nick Diaz. I would hate to hear, you know, five or ten or twenty years from now that Nick Diaz is one of those stories where he doesn't have any money and, you know, I I. I I don't want to talk bad about Nick Diaz. I just, I don't see him being one of those guys who's like, right, I'm going to invest and I'm going to do some smart banking decisions and things like that. I'm, I, I don't know how Nick Diaz spends his money. For all we know, he's one of those guys that doesn't spend much and just has a whole bunch of it in his bank account, but maybe not, you know? So I'll, it definitely sucks for Nick Diaz in that perspective. And just to clarify before, it wasn't after the GSP fight that he tested positive for marijuana. It was against Carlos Condit. And then oh, of yeah, course, back it, in the day, it was against Gomi. So you know, two suspensions later, and now if he gets a third one, you're right. Uh, he may he may get a lifetime ban, or or maybe it'll be two years because it's the it's his third one. So, and honestly, I don't see Nick Diaz. I don't see Nick Diaz changing from. I don't think he's the type of guy to be like, okay, I got that suspension. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something different, and I'm gonna change. I think Nick Diaz is one of those kids, or one of those people where, as a kid, if you spank Nick Diaz, he's not gonna learn and be disciplined. He's gonna try and kill you afterwards. So I think with mm-hmm. this one, if the if the 
the, if the commission decides, all right, we're going to suspend you for two years, that's probably the last we're going to see of Nick Diaz. I don't think he's going to come back. I'm just trying to think how old he is. You know, he's had a long career. He's had wars. Uh, the guy is, let's have a look. He's 31 years old. Wow, he's actually a lot younger than I thought. I don't know. Could he come back at 33? Yeah, absolutely. He could definitely come back at 33. I don't know that he necessarily will. Maybe he'll go overseas. You know, Ben Askren called him out already. Ben Askren. I love that guy because he doesn't miss a beat. He's always trying to capitalize on every opportunity. <laughs> and he was saying, you know, maybe coming over to Asia to fight some real MMA at 1FC. So who knows? Maybe we'll see that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Nick Diaz... So does he does he not need a license to go fight there? Is well, it like in The Simpsons where they were out on the ship and like something was banned and they had to go out in international, international waters, waters where there's like no no do they will they fight on a boat i'm basically asking are they going to fight on a boat casper yeah and uh t-pain is going to be there and lonely <laughs> island no well look okay so the way it is is obviously california only has jurisdiction in california and i think i could be wrong but i think uh, he may even be able to go to like say texas and fight in texas and the texas state athletic commission may not license him but in theory i think he can but he definitely could go over to brazil and fight in Brazil. The 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 ban is only in I don't know California. I guess he could go to Japan. He could he could definitely go to Japan. I don't even know if Japan has a commission. I'm not too sure. So yeah, they got they got like they're like yep, that's all right. You go in there. But I mean, the thing is, it's just a it's turned that main event that they had into a bit of a joke. I mean, the fight itself, it was you know we talked about it. It wasn't the greatest fight on on earth. It was a bit of a weird fight. Then you get both guys <laughs> testing positive for drugs. It was just yeah. It's definitely a bit of a stain. Um, left a bit of a stain in UFC 183. Mm. But I think they're just lucky that they got guys like Telus Laters and a few other stars that came out of that event. But yeah, what what a crazy week, Cass. Yeah, it was it was a weird one. And it's funny how you put that in perspective. Like the the success story wasn't even wasn't even the main event. You had all the it was a great card, but all the success really came from the undercard of that event. And who would have thought? Who would have thought? I think that's enough from us for another week. I think we're, we're done talking about this. We're going to stay on this story. We're going to probably, well, we, we may not chat about it next week, but depending on what happens, I know we'll definitely chat about it after the hearing. Uh, we've got some big guests coming next week. I'm really, 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 really excited. I want to say a big thank you to all our guests that we had on this week. Frank Shamrock, uh, Richard Perez, really great having him on, and of course, Talis Lates. Really excited for next weekend. I think pretty much every single major organization is having a show. You've got Bellator. You've got uh, World Series of Fighting. You've got the UFC. It's going to be absolutely huge. Cannot wait. Dennis, any last words for the fans? Yeah, you know, you and me, Cass, we uh, shot the breeze and discussed Anderson Silva, but it's really important for us to find out what our listeners think. So tell us, has this whole situation tarnished? Anderson Silva towards you or, or his legacy in your opinion, or do you still love the man and appreciate him for all the hard work that he's put in to MMA? Put it down in the comment section below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. As you know, if you're listening to this on YouTube, we'd love to have a bit of a chat to you guys on YouTube. See so questions and um, any comments will definitely be noted. As always, on Twitter as well, you guys can just tweet it at submission AUS. Always reply to um, all our tweets. Love chatting to you guys on Twitter. It's something that we really enjoy. And don't forget, guys, we are available on pretty much every other platform, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, everyone there is uh, for us this week. That's it. We'll see you next week.